That's, um... Why did the sandals matter during this interaction? I have no idea why saddle, sandals matter here. So he's not naked. Indeed, he's not naked. Um, is this sort of reference to his... Boshloingo? I, is that a... Is that a term? But yeah, seems like it. Um, <laughs> Harpoon snorkeling gear. He's basically going snorkeling. Indeed, yeah. So we've we've switched to Shakespearean here. Thou hast need to occupy your time, barbarian. And I think this is supposed to be the question. I don't know how to phrase that as a question. Thou hast need to occupy your time, barbarian. This is this is weird. Your time, barbarian. There we go. Oof. That would need rewriting. Only if something worth offering is within my reach, stated Grigner, as his hands crept to embracing the to embrace the tempting female who welcomed them with open willingness. She welcomed his hands. Just him should have been this should have been him. Um I don't know why she's just accepting his hands. But okay. Only if something is worth offering. If only if something worth offering is within my reach. What I love about this is that he seems to speak more like civilized, what we, we, we would expect a like modern civilized person to speak like, than she does. She's, she's the one speaking Shakespearean, and it's supposed to give us this effect of like, oh, she's the formal one, and he's the informal one. But the thing is, he speaks closer to the reader, so she's the one that comes off seeming weird. Now, if this were perhaps some kind of like meta project where we're trying to give the audience a sense of alienation, this could be very effective where we have a bunch of nobles who speak in like ancient Shakespearean and they're like the civilized ones. And then we have a narrator who speaks much more like an everyday person. It's not effective here because a barbarian, if this is the kind of picture we want to give, a barbarian should speak like Shakespearean, but then or like Elizabethan but then simplify it down. So it should have been him responding something like, I don't know, like have gold. Like, honestly, like he should be saying something like, you know, only if you have gold. He's, he's a barbarian, we're led to believe. Now maybe part of this is like trying to undermine our expectations of what a barbarian is. I don't expect that to be coming because given the tone of this so far, really just not expecting a whole lot here. Okay. From where do you come, barbarian? And by what are you called? She just drops the Elizabethan thou. She just drops that. <laughs> it was It was a one line only thing. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, no, this is, um, this is painful. Okay. Gasped the complying wench. Okay, so from where do you come, barbarian, and by what are you called? Gasped the complying wench, as Grigner smothered her lips with the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. So many questions. The engrossed titan ignored the queries of the inquisitive female. Why are we still describing her as a female? This is so weird. The word wench seems better than female in this case. At least then we're conveying like some sort of thing about the, the, the main character's disposition. But this now, the repetition of the word female now feels like the author is uncomfortable calling women women. This is so weird. The inquisitive female. That's so, like, distancing. The engrossed titan ignored the queries of the inquisitive female, pulling her towards him and crushing her sagging nipples to his... Oh, my God. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so bad. <laughs> and crushing her sagging nipples to his yearning chest. Can I say that on stream? Is this, like... <laughs> I don't know Twitch's TOSs, so feel free to just, like, if, if you're... <laughs> If you know them better than I do, please tell me before I get to something that's going to get me banned. <laughs> oh my goodness. Without struggle, she gave in, winding her soft arms around the harshly bronzed hide of Grigner corded shoulder blades as his calloused hands caressed her firm, protruding breasts. 
busts. Oh my goodness. That was that was like Freudian reading. Busts. Her firm protruding butt. I mean, to be fair, perfect synonym, basically. And like, we only read the first and last letter and then just skip over the middle of the word. So, you know, not the worst error to make here. In fact, that word would have made more sense. I would have recommended that. I, I mean, I would have recommended that in terms of like the level of severity of edits that I have for this. That's like, okay, if I can't change anything, I can only change one word. That's my recommendation for this one. My second recommendation is can we cut all of this? Oh my goodness, what is happening here? From where do you come, barbarian? What are you called? I feel like she would have swapped the order of these two questions. And then, I don't know why she's she's gasping, I guess, because he smothers her lips. Now, I thought he was trying to kill her. <laughs> she gasps? He, like, comes toward her, and she's all, like, open and willing, whatever. And then, like, we have this question. She gasps. And then he smothers her lips. What? With the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. What is this? I'm beginning to wonder if the author has ever kissed anyone. And it seems unlikely. That's like a, le a legitimate question that has now popped in to my head. I'm not like that. That's not even like mocking or anything. That's like. Like, I don't know that you would have ever described it this way if you had ever just experienced it once before this. It seems like what you would imagine it would be like if you had only ever watched intense romantic sex scenes from movies in the 70s. You're fine. This book, man. Someone else read it on stream. If we go by that, he wouldn't have experienced anything so far. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm glad that it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> if we go by that, he wouldn't have experienced anything. Yeah, it seems, I am, I am wondering if he's had any life experiences. It seems like maybe all of this was, like, crafted after watching the original version of the Dune movie. Don't watch it unless you are extremely drunk. It's actually pretty fun if you're extremely drunk. Okay. So this has got to stop, though. This inquisitive female stuff. This is this is so bizarre. I don't know why he's smothering her. We've got to be really careful about words that constantly get used for murder um, and describing them in the middle of an erotic scene. Gasped. Gasped does not communicate to me that, like, this could have been set up better. You know, he touches her, and then she gasps. That would have been fine. Um, but if she's gasping her words in the middle of this, and then he smothers her, <laughs> I get the sense he's killing her. We don't want that. We don't want to communicate that. That's bad. <laughs> the engrossed titan. I'm assuming we're talking about Grigner. This is weird. And he ignores the queries of the inquisitive female. We get it. She's asking a lot of questions, and he's a savage, right? He doesn't care about questions. He just wants to. He just wants to to smother her lips at the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. Of course, naturally, don't we all? But then after that, none of this sounds like it would be particularly enjoyable for her. Crushing her sagging nipples to his yearning chest. His calloused hands caressing her firm protruding busts. This all seems... I don't know... Um, I don't know who's... Like, who this was meant for. What audience this was... I mean, it was supposed to be meant for a sci-fi audience. Um, none of this sounds like an enjoyable experience. Very odd. You make love well, wench, admitted Grigner. Of course he thinks so. <laughs> As he reached for the vessel of potent wine, his charge had been quaffing. <laughs> what? His charge? Who's his charge? Who? Nope, not even going to try. I don't know. I have no idea what's going on in this. Um, I don't know who his charge is. His charge had been... Somebody's drinking wine. 
His char is she his charge? As he reached for the wine, his charge had been quaffing. So is she drinking wine? I don't... Whatever. Whatever. Somebody's drinking wine. Cut. <laughs> don't need to say the wine is potent. Just show that they're, you know, show them getting drunk. There you go. That's how you'd fix that. I mean, of course, one thing that we would have to do to fix all of this so far is probably cut this scene. I don't know what the scene is adding to us, but we will decide that later when we get to the end. Maybe this is setting up some sort of thematic climax. Seems unlikely. A flying foot caught the... A flying foot caught the mug Grigner had taken hold of, sending its blood-red contents sloshing over a flickering crescent, leashing tongues of bright orange flame to the foot-trodden floor. Remove yourself, Sirrah, the wench belongs to me, blabbered a drunken soldier, too far consumed by the influences of his virile brew to take note of the superior size of his adversary. Grigner lithely... Grigner lithely bounded from the startled female. His face lit up to an ashen-red ferocity, and his eyes locked in a searing, feral blaze toward the swaying soldier. Got a lot of fire imagery going on about this main character. I think we described his red hair as fiery and shocking or something. Um, we've got his ashen-red ferocity. I don't know what ashen-red means. That would have been fine in isolation if I had confidence that this author knew what words meant. And uh, we described his passion as he was smothering her in his in his red hot mouth or, or whatever we were saying. Bright orange flame to the foot trodden floor. By the way, this is what a floor is. A floor is always foot trodden. That's that's what makes it the floor. We walk on it. Um, the foot trodden floor. What is this adding to the floor? That's what we would have said. Leashing. I think he meant lashing. I feel like lashing is what we meant to put here. Leashing would be like restraining. Like catching it in a leash. This is odd. Lashing would be better here. I mean, if we can fix this sentence. A flying foot. There's something very odd, right? About like using the word flying in this way for a foot. I picture, like, the the sun god's boots, right? The the sun god, what's his name? Um, the the Greek one, and he's got boots with wings. That's what I was picturing here. His little shoes with wings. It's flying. Normally, flying doesn't do that to me. Like, I would picture like, oh, he's about to be kicked, but it's flying foot. It's, it's oh, he should have said a flying kick. That's what it is. You can say a flying kick. You can't say a flying foot. That's weird. Okay. It's blood red contents. In case your audience doesn't know what color wine is, I mean, maybe they were picturing white wine, but they're never picturing white wine. We say wine, people picture red wine. And of course, if it's this romantic scene, you're just priming your audience. We've already got all this like red imagery. They're not gonna picture white wine, that'd be weird. Oof, and we've got the startled female again. I don't know why we're using the word female. Um, pro tip, don't describe females as female. For some reason, that's just weird. That's just not the word we use. <laughs> just, there are like normal ways to just dis like say this. We have words for this, buddy. Okay, whatever. He's with the female. Their eyes are locked in a feral blaze toward the swaying soldier. Grigner is, you know, he's about to attack him. To hell with you, braggard, bellowed the angered accordion. He was a bro in there for a minute. To hell with you, braggard, bellowed the angered accordion as he hefted his finely honed broadsword. The staggering soldier clumsily reached toward the pommel of his dangling sword, but before his hands ever touched the oaken hilt, a silvered flash was slicing the heavy air. The thews of the savage's lashing right arm bulged from the glistening bronzed hide as his blaze, as his blade bit deeply into the soldier's neck, lopping off the confused head of his senseless tormentor.
this is nonsense. This is all nonsense. There is so much, there's more description here than action. And that's that's the theme that we keep getting. If we were going to, we're going to do that. Um, here, is this a good color? Good, we can see that. Now we can do a better one. We'll do, do, do blue, I mean. Okay. Reached. We have a staggering soldier clumsily reached. That's one verb. Toward the pommel of his dangling sword, but before his hands ever touched, touched, but that's not actually, this is, this is like, uh, this is a, um, What's that phrase? Prepositional. There we go. For his hands ever touched the oaken hilt. This is all just like a, an introductory phrase here. A silvered flash was slicing. Was slicing as our verb. And this is passive. Should have been sliced. The heavy air. We get nothing by making this passive. The thews of the savage's lashing right arm bulged. We've got things bulging. That's our verb. Bulged. Which is passive. It's passive because it doesn't require anything to happen. From the glistening bronzed hide as his blade bit deeply. Bit. That's our other verb. So we have and lopping off, which is passive again. And lopped off is what we should have had. It bit deeply into the soldier's neck and lopped off the confused head of his senseless tormentor. Of course, we should eliminate all of the adjectives from this. There's no need for almost any of them. Staggering would have been fine. The staggering soldier or the soldier clumsily reached but we should not have this and like these convey the same image and it's like we're just not trusting the reader to be able to like put together an image of a soldier that maybe has lost his bearings a little bit that's ridiculous we have a person who reached for a thing as a sword sliced a dude's arm bulges and his blade bites into the neck of a soldier four things happen in a paragraph of probably 200 words right here. 200, that's excessive. This isn't 200. Sorry, I was actually doing like a character count in my head. Maybe this is more like, I don't know, 75 words or something like that. That's a lot of words though. This is a lot of words where not much is actually happening. With a nauseating thud, the severed oval top, what is the severed, that's his head. <laughs> the severed oval this guy's just like straight up telling his story in shapes now the severed oval toppled to the floor of course don't forget about the ovals in it, it, he's got his you know his oval ovals the ovals embedded in the oval which contain the orbs we've got orbs ovals there's gonna be a triangle coming up soon with a nauseating thud, the severed oval toppled to the floor as the segregated torso of Grigner's bovine antagonist swayed, then collapsed in a pool of swirled crimson. That sentence is impressive for its use of so many incorrect ways to describe things. Why is it a bovine antagonist? collapsed in a pool of swirled crimson. I don't know why it's swirling. I don't know if that's the wine or the blood. I'm pretty sure it's the blood, though. I don't know why it's swirling. It's very odd. And it's a segregated torso now because they were separated, right? The head fell off the main body. That's how you segregate body parts. <laughs> it's just segregated. It's not like... This is so weird. I wouldn't have even thought to describe it this way. Like, that's why it's weird to me. I wouldn't have even thought of using this as a description. I feel like some of these, I think of it and I'm like, oh yeah, if I was like, if I was really, really young, if I was like 15 or something and I was trying to write a novel that I like loosely based off of a picture of a caricature of Star Wars after I saw Spaceballs the first time, then like maybe I would use these words. And then of course I would edit them out immediately realizing that they read melodramatically and terribly. And... Some of these are just bizarre, though. Severed oval. In the confusion, the soldier's fellows confronted Grigner with unsheathed cutlasses directed toward the latter's scowling makeup. In the confusion, what does makeup mean here? 
I feel like I don't know English anymore. I like, I don't know. I don't know what these words are supposed to be meaning. Directed toward the latter scowling makeup. I'm guessing his facial expression. That's not what makeup means. Is this soldier actually? He's he's definitely not wearing makeup, right? That would have been that would have been talked about more. The slut should have picked his quarry more carefully, roared the victor in a mocking baritone growl as he wiped his dripping blade on the prostrate form and returned it to its scabbard. Roared the victor, I'm assuming is, the victor is Grigner. No. Wait, the slut should have, is he calling the soldier a slut? <laughs> Directed toward the latter scowling makeup. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. This is bizarre. I think I would also, this is the other thing that I would ask the author for if I was actually editing this. Editing this. I would say, like, I need, like, a play-by-play. -play. Draw with pictures if you can. Maybe that's how that, like, manuscript ended up coming about with pictures. <laughs> His editor was like, I need pictures. I need to see how this is actually happening in your mind before I can even advise you on how to write it on paper. This is bizarre. The slut should have picked his quarry more carefully, roared the victor in a mocking baritone growl. Let's check chat for a sec here. There's only so much sen sentence can handle. Indeed, yeah, and it is it is far less than the amount that we are continually giving sentences in this work. Sentences can handle much, much less than this. Yeah, triangles, hopefully those will. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing triangles. I hope we see triangles after all these uh, these ovals. I'm going to go back to red now. Oh, turn everything else red, of course. That's what I wanted you to do. The fool should have shown more prudence. However, you shall rue your actions while rotting in the pits, stated one of the sprawled soldier's comrades. Grigner's hand began to remove his blade from its leather housing, but retarded the motion and face of the blades waving before his face. Dismiss your hand from the hilt, barbarian, or you shall find a foot of steel sheathed in your gizzard. Grigner weighed his uh, Grigner weighed his position, observing his plight, whereupon he took the soldier's advice as the only logical choice. To attempt to hack his way from the present predicament could only warrant certain death. He was of no mind to bring upon his own demise if an alternate path presented itself. The will to necessitate his life force, if it, the will to necessitate his life, forced him to yield to the superior force in hopes of a moment of carelessness, of carelessness later, upon the part of his captors, in which he could effect a more plausible means of escape. This is like, are any of you familiar with Kant? Immanuel Kant is a philosopher. He writes like this. I feel like this was actually taken straight out of Kant, specifically right here. To attempt to hack his way from his present predicament could only warrant certain death. He was of no mind to bring upon his own demise if an alternate path presented itself. This is a really long-winded way of saying, of course, he's going to try to propagate his own life. He's going to try to continue living. He doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to die is... Doesn't want to die. That is five words that could have summed up this entire paragraph. Kant does that. Five words. Never is five words. But of course he spoke German in like the 17th century. He had an excuse when we translate it. It's very, very difficult to translate when you get a word in German that's strung together 20 different German words and somehow means some intense, complicated philosophy of life and human will. This does not have that same excuse. This is just long-winded. Sheathed in your gizzard. That's a weird thing to say. So much of this is just weird. That's the thing that, like, gets me, is it doesn't seem as much that this is... Like, this is a, a weird way to see the world. <laughs> I think a lot of writers, when we write things, it's like a reflection of how we see the world in some sense. And I don't even know how to begin dissecting the worldview that someone who writes this has. 
seems maybe a little bit um, maybe misogynist. Definitely some awkwardness around calling women women. This is a very strange use of the word retarded here as a verb. He began to remove his blade from its leather housing, but slowed the motion, basically retarded the motion. But he slowed down the motion in face of the blades waving before his face. So he's like, he's about to draw his sword. People are attacking him. There's the waving blades in his face. And he's right about to remove his sword. And then he's like, I should slow down. I'm going too fast here. Those blades, well, they're not that close to my face. The fool should have more shown more prudence. However, you shall rue your actions while rotting in the pits. However, that's a... See, it's just it's just bizarre. It's not even like it's it's hard to discern the bad from the bizarre. Like at what point at what point is it clear to me that like you didn't know what these words meant? Like I don't know if there were times where he was like trying to be poetic and did have confidence in what the words meant or he literally pulled a random word out of a thesaurus. Maybe all of it is just random words. And this is sort of like, you know, clock strikes twice a day. Broken clock strikes twice a day. Maybe it's one of those situations. Who's saying this? Oh, I think, uh, let's see. The will to necessitate his life force, uh, his life forced him to yield to the superior force. Force and force. Ugh. In hopes of a moment of carelessness later upon the part of his captors in which he could effect a more plausible means of escape. This is a very long sentence. Obviously, we don't want long sentences. It's a very confusing sentence. So, I'm assuming Grigner is saying this next line of dialogue that is indented for some reason. Just some of them are indented. Maybe there was a drawing here. <laughs> you may steady your arms. I will go without a struggle. Your decision is a wise one, yet perhaps you would have been better off if you forced death. The soldier's mouth wrinkled to a sadistic grin of knowing mirth as he prodded his prisoner on with his sword point. Okay. Yep, this one has a lot of, like, clear overriding. I'm leaning toward the random words out of a thesaurus answer because, first of all, is he saying, is the, is the soldier saying here, perhaps you would have been better off had you forced death? Like, is he saying you might have been better off if you tried to kill me? Like, wise decision, buddy. Come along with us quietly. But, you know, you might have been better off if you tried violence. I don't know why he would say that. He's trying to capture this guy, right? He's trying to, like, win. <laughs> You might have been better off if you didn't let us win so easily. The soldier's mouth wrinkled to a sadistic grin. Uh, that's not how grinning works. Of knowing mirth. Just, in fact, none of this. None of this. As he prodded his, sig his prisoner on with his sword point. If you're prodding someone, it's with a pointy object. You don't prod them with, like, the flat end of the blade. He prodded his prisoner on with his sword. If you wanted to keep that, that's how you would say it. We don't need the redundance. Of course, you would not want to keep that if you were actually editing this. You wouldn't want to keep any of this. I like this. This dialogue doesn't even make sense. So how would we like fix this dialogue? Because I'm already noticing there's like huge problems with just the dialogue, the basic dialogue in this story. Basically, I mean, like, we would have to teach the author how to write dialogue. This would this would cease to be a, like, edit of one work. So usually what a developmental editor does when we approach a work, we don't approach individual works in the way that, like, a copy editor or line editor does, where, like, the idea is you want to develop the writing and you want to develop the writer and the writer's ideas. And so your goal is sort of longer term or a little more developmental in the sense that you want them to walk away from this a better writer with better ideas 
and better works. They're going to produce better works and your your work as an editor will be lesser down the road. You can be focused more on more technicalities, more of the the details and stuff like that. The better it is when it reaches your desk. And looking at this, I mean you'd effectively be teaching somebody how to write. The in trying to develop this into a better work I the it would be immense. The dialogue would need to be rewritten probably from scratch. I mean this um it's so over the top, it's so melodramatic and it isn't immediately clear as it should be if this is intentionally melodramatic. If it was intentionally melodramatic, we could work with that. But you want to give that campy atmosphere up front. And we weren't giving that campy atmosphere up front. We were giving like the like Tolkien-esque deep fantasy feeling or deep sci-fi feeling where we've got like all of these like academic words we're just throwing around for random poetry. You don't start off like that and then switch to campy. Just like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the show on Netflix or the, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Like it doesn't start off like showing a really intense thriller scene. No, it starts off campy and it stays campy. You want to reveal that campiness up front because otherwise when it gets campy, your audience leaves. That's not what they were there for. So if we wanted this to be campy, we would have had to have started it campy and we would have started by probably riffing off of Star Wars or whatever inspired this. Um, this uh, started off way too seriously for it to be intentionally campy. Yeah. After an indiscriminate period of marching... <laughs> what? Okay, okay. After an indiscriminate period of marching through slinking alleyways and dim moonlighted streets, the procession confronted a massive seraglio. The palace area was surrounded by an iron grating with a lush garden upon all sides. The group was admitted through the gilded gateway, and Grigner was led along a stone pathway bordered by plush vegetation, lustfully enhanced. There's that word rearing its head again. Lustfully enhanced by the moon's shimmering rays. Upon reaching the palace, the group was granted entrance, and after several minutes of explanation, led through several winding corridors to a richly drapered, to which a richly draped chamber. Got a lot of repetition going on here. Several, several, lustfully. Um, I don't know why we are describing the vegetation so much. We've got this lush garden, plush vegetation. Vegetation isn't plush. That's odd. Maybe he just like really wants to lie down on it. And of course, it's lustfully enhanced by the moon's shimmering rays. This is um, incredibly, what's the word? Cliche. That's super cliche. The moon's shimmering rays. The gilded gateway. And <laughs> what does he mean an indiscriminate period of marching? I'm assuming we're supposed to be like, oh, they were marching for a long time. Okay. Through slinking alleyways and dim moonlighted streets. They're not a procession. Processions are bigger. If we imagine a procession, there's like a lot of people like in a train, like it's a big procession. They're just a small group. It's just him and a couple of soldiers. And then we go off about this garden. I'm making a note here, garden. This is the garden section. It's like we're taking a tour through Home Depot. We just hit the garden section. Bam. He's marveling at it. I don't know why we have a garden section here. Maybe. Now, maybe if I were extending good faith here and I was thinking, what's he trying to set up? I would think he's trying to set up an action scene that will soon take place in the garden. However, having read the previous page, I feel like I know better. And I am inclined to believe that this garden will never be mentioned again. We will see. <laughs> oh my goodness. 
my i'm sorry i don't know who that bot like or like who that bot is no i like I, it's a bot obviously i mean i don't know where it comes from if that's um it could be twitches because i think i turned streamlabs off streamlabs had a bot and that bot was super annoying so i tried to like but i'll i'll every time it comes up i always allow 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 unless i mean unless i won't at some point if that happens but i doubt it um but yeah i think uh I don't know who, what the, what the bot's doing or like where the bot comes from. If, if there are other automatic bots that are just like added in, um, feel free to like tell me if you know about them and where I can find them. That would be very helpful. But I, I thought there was just the Streamlabs one, the cloud bot, and that's what I disabled before. Um, but I'll look for another one. Maybe Twitch has one. Whew. Okay, so we've got several and several over here. You don't want to repeat that. Those are that's that's a word that's very noticeable. Several is is like, and and we're being weirdly vague about things like. And. So we're being vague about time, an indiscriminate period of marching through like slinking alleyways. Like the main character should know about how much time is passing. And this is narrated sort of from the main character's perspective, Grigner. If it's not from the main character's perspective, if this is third person, you know, like omniscient, God's eye view, whatever, then we definitely should know how much time passed. Like if God is watching over this, if we are, you know, if we are taking the, the godly perspective and watching this, God usually knows about how much time has passed. It's helpful to be all knowing. If that's not the case, though, if it is from Grigner's perspective, definitely should have some idea of how much time has passed. After about an hour of walking, after so much walking that his legs could carry him no more, after not so long a period of walking that he was tired, but sufficiently enough that his legs were sore, right? We can, we can describe some amount, how is he feeling after doing all of this walking? And we just have an indiscriminate period of time that he was walking. It can't be disclosed, because if we told you, we would have to kill you. Worry not, though. If you're reading this, you are already close to death. Confronting the group was a short, stocky man seated upon a golden throne. Tapestries of richly draped regal blue silk covered all walls of the chamber, while the steps leading to the throne were plated with sparkling white ivory. The man upon the throne had a naked wench seated at each of his arms, and a trusted advisor seated in back of him. Seated in back of him? What? Is he sitting on someone's lap? He's If he's sitting behind the man upon the throne, yeah, somebody on the throne, and he's, there's a guy sitting behind the guy on the throne. Either, either this is a two-seater throne, vertically, or somebody set a chair up behind the throne. Now, if there is a chair behind the throne, thrones are usually pretty big because they usually house important people. That's what makes them thrones. You wouldn't see it. If there's just a chair behind the throne in which someone is sitting, in which case our character would not know who is sitting behind the throne, literally behind it. This is weird. Like the imagery isn't even consistent to the point that I can try to conceive of how the author imagined it. Unless this is just some piece of knowledge the author knew and was trying to, like, import to the reader, right? They're trying to just tell you that there is a chair behind the throne. That's important because it's going to be the guy behind the throne who stabs the king or whatever it is, right? This is something important to it that the author just knows and is just telling you. But you wouldn't see this. At each corner of the chamber, stood uh, a guard stood at attention, with upraised pikes supported in their hands, golden chainmail adorning their torsos, and barred helmets emitting scarlet plumes and shrouding their heads. The man rose from his throne to the dais surrounding it. His plush turquoise robe dangled loosely from his chunky frame. 
The soldiers surrounding Grigner fell to their knees with heads bowed to the stone masonry of the floor in fearful dignity to their sovereign, liege. Sovereign, comma, liege. I don't know what heavy lifting that comma is doing. Um, it's interesting. Commas are probably the least important misuse going on here. So we have sparkling white ivory. If you've seen ivory ever, it doesn't sparkle. Probably won't surprise you. Elephant tusks, not sparkly. Um, unless maybe it's made of like a unicorn horn. Regal blue silk covered all walls of the chamber. I don't know how we're picturing that chair and the guy sitting behind the throne. And he has a naked wench seated at each of his arms. Okay. The barred helmets emitting scarlet plumes and shrouding their heads. Like, I'm assuming we're talking about like the feathers. Like the, the, the scarlet, like the feathery things that would be in armor, right? I guess it's so thick that it would be shrouding their heads, but that seems like a bad armor design. That seems like a very not smart armor design if you don't want your guards to be blinded when they start fighting people. A plush turquoise robe dangled loosely from his chunky frame. Okay. And then everybody immediately kneels. Explain the purpose of this intrusion upon my chateau. Okay. You don't let the guards in and then ask them what their purpose is for being there. If you're the king, you're always doing important business, right? You're not just having your office hours. You don't just sit there on the throne waiting for people to come in with their problems. Then people come in. Like, no, you have like a hearing and it's like, it's like a big deal. You are a famous person. You are the big deal. People have to schedule time to see you. So he's just, I guess, holding his office hours, and then suddenly all of the guards burst in, and this guy, this king, feels intruded upon. Despite the fact that he was already sitting in the throne room, there was clearly nothing else going on. There weren't advisors who were already talking to him, and he was like, advisors, leave. I have to talk to these guards that seem rushed. So we've just got a very strange, like, setup going on here for this scene. It hasn't been, like, established how we're supposed to be picturing all of these like concurrent events we just have famous guy sitting in the room he's got guards around him and he's got an advisor who's sitting behind him somehow somehow we know this and he's sitting probably in a chair behind him but maybe this is a two-seater throne sitting horsey style and these these people come in and they did not tell the king beforehand, assuming this is a king, they did not tell the king beforehand why they were coming in or that they just brought the savage Grigner. Like, that would be kind of like a thing you'd want to mention before you come into the throne room. Okay. They just burst in. Explain the purpose of this intrusion upon my chateau. Your serenity, resplendent and noble grandeur, we have brought this yokel before you. The soldier gestured toward Grigner. For the redress or your all-knowing wisdom in judgment regarding his fate. The soldier gestured toward Grigner. This is a stage direction <laughs> that's been thrown in the middle of this guy's dialogue. <laughs> this is testing. This is, oof. Wow. I don't know why you would do that. Why would you put this in parentheses? What's the stylistic choice that's going on here? This is so weird. Your sir entity. Your sir entity. I love it. I wouldn't even change that. I would say, you know what? This this should stay. Your sir entity. Resplendent and noble grandeur. We have brought this mere yokel before you for the redress of your all-knowing wisdom and judgment regarding his fate. Golden dialogue line right here. This, don't change anything. Keep this, 100%.
you know what at this point at this point i think i wouldn't even bother so i wouldn't bother editing this to make this a serious work i would be editing this toward campy and i'm not sure it would require like i would meet with the author first my goal would be to meet or talk to the author just a little bit to see can they handle knowing that that's what i'm editing it for <laughs> Can they handle the truth? Otherwise, I might just edit it for Campy and just like not tell them. And and then I'll say, okay, these are the magazines we should submit it to. Sci-Fi Comedy Weekly or whatever it is. And they'd be like, why are we submitting it to that one? And I'll be like, trust me. You want to be famous, right? Believe me. This is how to do it. It would have been famous for exactly the same reasons. Probably not, actually. In real life, though, these things get famous mostly because they're bad and people don't seem to know the people who created them. Down on your knees, lout, and pay proper homage to your sovereign, commanded the pudgy noble of Grigner. The noble of Grigner? The... Grigner is the main character. The pudgy noble of Grigner. What? Commanded the pudgy noble of Grigner. The main character's name is Grigner. I don't know what, who are we talking about? Grigner isn't a place. How are you a noble of a person? And the person is a savage. This doesn't make sense. I'm assuming there was another word that was supposed to be used here. And the guy was just like thinking in his head Grigner's name and wrote that. Who is this person? Okay. By the surly beard of Mrifk, Grigner kneels to no man, scowled the massive barbarian. We know. And you can't scowl words. Same problem. Said Grigner. You dare to deal this blasphemous act to me? You are indeed brave, stranger. Yet your valor smacks of foolishness. I find you to be the only fool, sitting upon your pompous throne, enhancing the rolling flabs of your belly in the midst of your elaborate luxuriant. Soldier standing at Grigner's side smote him, <laughs> smote him heavily in the face with the flat of his sword, cutting short the harsh words and knocking his battered helmet to the masonry with an echoing clang. Okay. Got that smoting. That smoting is happening again. So much smoting is going on in this story. Cutting short the harsh words. In case our audience didn't know, he was trying to insult him right here. And that's why the soldier cut off the harsh words of Grigner. You are welcome for the narrative interlude. And the fact that he would sit here Insulting the king person, the noble. With this many words. This guy is a barbarian. He is a savage, supposedly. That's what we've been telling the audience he is. We've been telling the audience he is a savage. We haven't... It's not just other characters have labeled him a savage and we're sort of like buying on the reader to, you know, import that, to assume that this guy's some sort of savage and then it ends up being a kind of message about racism. No, that's not what's going on. We have told the reader very directly, no, 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 Grigner is a barbarian. He is a savage, 100%. And then he speaks again more eloquently than everybody else in the room. <laughs> Enhancing the rolling flabs of your belly in the midst of your elaborate luxuriant. The guy, the soldier over here, only used the word blasphemous, brave, and valor. This is just enhancing. He uses the word enhancing. Who uses the word enhancing in the middle of trying to insult somebody? <laughs> Your ignorance is only enhancing my wrath. That is a bizarre word to come to mind in the middle of, like, rage. The paunchy noble's sagging round face flushed suddenly pale, then pastily lit up to a lustrous cherry-red radiance. I don't know what that means. 
I don't know how you pastily light up. You, you light up, but with no color, except a lustrous cherry red radiance. And lustrous, again, got this, at least this time it's used more correctly, I guess. It's lustrous cherry red. Red is sort of, I guess, like a lusty-ish color. It's lustier than whatever was happening before. What, did he, what, what was the other lusty thing that happened? Oh my goodness. We had it. Oh, yeah. I didn't even comment on the chunky, chunsky frame. Oh, yeah. The, the vegetation was lustful, right? <laughs> All that sexy vegetable. <laughs> his sagging flabs. Oh, his lips trembled with malicious rage while emitting a muffled, sibilant gibberish. His sagging flabs rolled like a tub of upset jelly then compressed as he sucked in his gut in an attempt to conceal his softness. A tub of upset jelly. I actually like this. I like this a lot. This is really artful. Um, this would have been really funny imagery if the rest of it weren't so hilarious. He sucked in his gut in an attempt to conceal his softness. This noble is so afraid that people are going to think that he's too soft because he's extremely large. He's a very rotund man. He doesn't want people to know about his softness. That's why he hides it. And he gives us this harsh, firm exterior. This is golden. This is wonderful. Change nothing. The prince regained his statue. Oh, this is about statues now. This is relevant to the modern age, of course. He wants to reclaim his statue. That's why he's so impassioned. The prince regained his statue then spoke to the soldiers surrounding Grigner, his face conforming to an ugly expression of sadistic humor. Take this uncouth heathen to the vault of misery and be sure that his agonies are long and drawn out before death can release him. Take this uncouth heathen to the vault of misery. This doesn't appear to be the name of a place. This appears to be his description of the place. Because if it was the name of the place, he would have capitalized this. It would have been the, the vault of of misery and then it would have been the official place that's the vault where all the misery occurs instead he's describing this he's describing the torture chamber and he's just like take this uncouth heathen to the the vault of misery as i'm, I'm going to call it this one time it'll be great the vault of misery and be sure that his agonies are long and drawn out before death can release him this is, this is just odd this prince doesn't give a crap about this barbarian this prince is just going to be like oh and i'm glad we finally found out that it's a prince okay this prince, why is the prince on the throne? Whatever, the prince has a throne. Okay. So this prince doesn't want this barbarian in his throne room. And he's going to say the speech. He's going to give a speech about it. He's not just going to be like, get the savage away from me. Why, why would you bring a savage in here? This is the throne room. These carpets are nice. I don't want him to vomit on it. But no, he's going to give us an entire speech about how, how badly he wants this barbarian to be tortured. As you wish, sire, your command shall be heeded immediately. Once we finish this sentence, answered the, he didn't say that part, answered the soldier on the right of Grigner as he stared into the barbarian's seemingly unaffected face. Seemingly unaffected face. Oh my goodness. The advisor seated in the back of the noble sl <laughs> That sentence does not say what you think it says, friend. The advisor seated in the back of the noble. He is sitting in the back of the noble. That image, that is what was conveyed. The advisor seated in the back of the noble slowly rose and advanced to the side of his master, motioning the wenches seated at his, at his sides to remove themselves. He lowered his head and whispered to the noble, Eminence punishment you have decreed will cause much misery to this scum, yet it will only last a short time, then release him to a land beyond the sufferings of the human body. Why not mellow him in one of the subterranean vaults for a few days, then send him to life labor in one of your buried mines? To one such as he, a life spent in the confinement of the Stygian pits will be an infinitely more appropriate and lasting torture. Oh, thank you for uh, the follow, Tenchi, Tenchi Sawada. 
this is um this is silly this is very silly he's this this noble guy is giving a speech this is, this is a straight up speech nobody talks this long um while they're talking about what to do with this one barbarian in the throne room like nobody seems even affected by the fact that there is a savage a literal savage as everybody is describing it in the throne room you do not want that throne rooms are nice you have the nice carpet in the throne room you have the marble floors you have the the throne you have the king the the or the prince whoever it is you have all of these people whose time is precious you don't just bring a random savage into the throne room it doesn't matter how many guards he's killed you put him on the gallows, and then the king can say, okay, yeah, behead him right now. Do it. Or you put him in the prison. The king never meets these people. It's ridiculous. That was one thing. Um, so Game of Thrones did that really, really well. That They didn't have... Um, they were really good about handling, like, throne room scenes. I think a lot... This is something that, some for some reason, like, constantly gets really messed up in a lot of fantasy. Um, but, like... Like, this thought that, like, the king deals with a lot of these everyday problems. They did have their, like, quote-unquote office hours where they would open up the, the throne room to the public. Those, though, like, first of all, like, they were heavily screened, right? Like, you are interviewing nobles or you're interviewing, like, the peasants basically on their way in. And usually they're not just peasants. They're not just, like, random peasants from the area. Um, usually what it was was they were people who represented business interests. Um, so they would be people who just were less rich nobles. Um, and they'd be, uh, you know, people, traders and the the heads of certain like guilds or whatever the heck. So you, you don't just have like, you would never drag a barbarian into the throne room to ask what should be done with him. Um, and also these guards would usually know what should be done with them. You throw them in prison. Very easy. That's like the, the one function of a guard. That's their only job. Like you had one job and instead of going to the prison, you brought him to the throne room. Bad move. Because that's how the king gets killed. The noble cupped his drooping double chin in the folds of his briming palm, meditating for a moment upon the rationality of the counselor's words. Then raised his shaggy brown eyebrows and turned toward the advisor, eyes aglow. As always, Agafund. You speak with great wisdom. Your words ring of a, of a great knowledge concerning the nature of one such as he, saith the king. The noble turned toward the prisoner with a noticeable shimmer, reflecting his frog-like eyes and his lips contorting to a greasy grin. I have decided to void my previous decree. The prisoner shall be removed to one of the palace's underground vaults. There he shall stay, until I have decided that he has sufficiently simmered, whereupon... He is to be allowed to spend the remainder of his days at labor in one of my mines. This is the evil plan. The evil plan is to have him do labor in one of the mines. The reason that this evil plan is absurd is because there are already people doing labor in the mines. There should be, in order to do work at a mine, in order to, like, mine things, you need a lot of people working in the mines. Mines require a lot of labor. So for him to be laughing about this as his evil plan, I highly doubt he's laughed about this evil plan for every one of the miners that are already there. Now, they could all be prisoners who have spurned the king to such a degree that he has he's been given the opportunity to give his evil speech about it every time he sends someone to the mines. But that would mean that there are so many people that are coming into this chamber because these guards just keep bringing the barbarians in. <laughs> the, like, justifying this rationally is more absurd than, like, just looking at this at the face value. And the face value is pretty silly. So when we construct these sorts of fantasy scenes, one of the things that, and I realize this is, this is like a sci-fi scene. This is a lot more fantasy to me. This seems much more like a fantasy scene. Either way, though, the tone of it is going to be pretty much the same. Um, the only difference is going to be like technology versus magic, right? Like, but it's it's basically um, more or less, aside from some artistic interpretations, the sh the same genre. Um, if we are building up this scene, this throne room scene, we have to be like really, really careful about how we're treating the business, the day to day business of the throne room. It has to be realistic. This is not realistic. Um, the the king does not generally lower themselves to the businesses of the 
you know, the plebeians or whatever, every time they need to issue a punishment to the barbarian. These guards would all be fired. Upon hearing this, Grigner realized that his fate would be far less merciful than death to one such as he. We've used this twice now, to one such as he. We'll finish the sentence. And Who is used to roaming the countryside at will. Okay, there we are. Who is used to roaming the countryside at will. So it's probably because he's a savage, right? The, to one such as he. This usually refers to something more significant than just, like, the one thing we already know about this character is that they are a savage. So, to one such as he is usually referring to something more significant than something we already know about the character this directly. So, it would be something more like, something more subtle. Maybe we find out that Grigner is, um, like, a minority race in the kingdom. And then we would say, to one such as he. If that's, like, the, his, like, minority status in the kingdom has already been said once or twice or a couple of times, um and not like the 15 times that we've seen it mentioned that Grigner is a savage, then we would say to one such as he, and it would bring emphasis to whatever important quality it is we're trying to let our reader know is like influencing this moment. Oh, he didn't expect such a generous punishment for one such as he, a minority who typically gets worse punishments in this kingdom or something like that. Instead though, we're just throwing it in here randomly and it's, it's, it's supposed to be drawing attention to the fact that he's a barbarian. But the characterization of that barbarianism, or that barbarous, whatever it is, the the characterization of that has been so poor so far that, like, it does feel like it needs reminding. Because he doesn't seem like a barbarian. The dialogue feels stilted like from a play. Indeed, yeah, exactly. It does feel like it's from a play. It's it's silly. It feels like it's like straight-up Shakespearean. I shall never understand the ways of your twisted civilization. I simply defend my honor and am condemned to life confinement by a pig who sits on his royal ass wooing whores and knows nothing of the affairs of the land he, man he imagines to rule. Lectures Grigner? It's a question. It's an open question. Did he lecture him? We don't know. We never... Grigner... Again, he's a barbarian. I don't know why he's lecturing people. I don't know how he's doing that. Like, what lectures does he have stored in his brain that he's able to just deliver on the spot to people? Enough of this. Away with the slut before I lose my control. Before I loose my control. It's obviously lose, though. Away with the slut before I lose my control. Why? What are we? Who are we calling a slut? They keep calling Grigner a slut, right? Am I going crazy? Grigner is the one that they keep calling a slut. Is there some like connotation to slut that I'm not like, I'm gonna have to look this up now. Nope, there is not. There is not a different definition. That is exactly what I thought it meant. Yeah, so it only usually refers to women. <laughs> And for some reason, and not in a good way, but for some reason, we keep calling Grigner, who is a man, right? We've called him he before. Yes, to one such as he. I don't know why we keep calling him a slut. This is bizarre. Seeing the peril of his position, Grigner searched for an opening. Crushing prudence to the sward, he plowed into the soldier at his left arm, taking hold of his sword, and bounding to the dais supporting the prince before the startled guards could regain their composure. A goffined leaped Grig what a goffined leaped Grigner and his sire, but found a sword blade permeating the length of his ribs before he could loose his weapon. Before he could loose his weapon. Before he could loose his weapon. I don't know what that, like, how to interpret that verb phrase. That verb phrase does not make sense. It doesn't make actual English sense. Um, but found a sword blade permeating the length of his ribs before he could loose, loose his weapon. So maybe this was supposed to be before he could, like, let his weapon loose, basically. Before he could loose his weapon. Okay, if that's fixed. I don't know. A goffined leaped Grigner, Grigner and his sire. His sire, the placement of this makes it look like it's referring to Grigner, 
but I'm assuming it's le it's referring to Agafand. And he leaps over Grigner and his sire, but found a sword blade. Oh, but found a sword blade permeating him. So he found a sword blade through him before he could let his weapon loose as he leaps over Grigner and his, his lord. This is described so awkwardly. Permeating the length of his ribs. It permeated the length of his ribs. Ribs are rounded. Um, so to permeate their length, it's like going through the length of his ribs. If it's... I, it's, what do we do to picture that? Like it, the length of your ribs? So if we like picture them protruding from the spine and we put the sword like through the rib, through the pointy end of the rib. Sounds painful, I guess. That's what I'd go with. Sounds painful. Don't recommend it. Don't put a blade in the length of your ribs. That's the, that's the lesson from this. The counselor slumped to his knees. Also, don't put it in your story. That's the, that's the bigger lesson from this. The counselor slumped to his knees as Grigner slid his crimsoned blade from Agafen's ribcage. The fat prince stood undulating in un insurmountable fear before the edge of the fiery maned comet. His flabs of jellied blubber pulsating to and fro in ripples of flowing terror. Where is your wisdom and power now, your mag, your majesty? Growled Grigner. I like this word. This sounds like a jester magician. Majesty. That's perfect. Keep it. Keep it. We are calling him Majesty from now on. We know what he meant, and we know that the writing meant something better. Um, undulating. So the fat prince is undulating in fear, insurmountable fear. He's undulating in insurmountable fear. He has within him a fear that he cannot surmount. And he's undulating about it. At the edge of the fiery maned comet. I'm assuming that means Grigner. We wanna we usually, when we're describing our main character, when we insert them in the middle of the scene, want to use words that the audience will be familiar with so that they can interpret this correctly. And that's not happening here. That's fine. But his flabs of jellied blubber pulsating to and fro in ripples of flowing terror. That is like, I, I don't know how you mean this seriously. Those are definitely comedic words, right? You had to write this with a knowledge that this is a ridiculous way of describing a prince. Unless you're just laughing internally. You're constructing the scene where you have the, the evil prince. You're trying to emphasize how bad and how evil he is by having him. He punishes people willy-nilly, etc. He's like, oh, I want him to work in the labor camps for all eternity. And then you you like want your reader to take satisfaction in his death. So you describe him in the most like over the top disgusting possible way as flabs of jellied blubber pulsating to and fro in ripples. And you think that your reader will feel satisfied with this. It's still ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. If you want the reader to be satisfied in their death, we need to make them do something that would be horrible and sending somebody to work in a mine while yes mine conditions tend to be horrible just means that you're making them a miner like er miner and miners exist even in this world you're sending them to do a job so there's no way that it can be that bad of a punishment it's not endless torture like, granted, obviously, most of us probably would not want to work in a mine, but there are people who do it. It's still a job. So it's not like the, it's not the, you know, sending him to be standing on the spike pits or whatever. We could have thought of so much more over-the-top stuff for this villain. And we do that, and then suddenly we get his flabs of jelly blubber pulsating to and fro in ripples of flowing terror as he's dying, and... The effect is just comedic, and I don't think it's comedic in a way that we can claim is intentional. We can't, like, claim the intentionality of this back from the ridiculousness of the writing because there's been no payoff for it. 
Where is your wisdom and power now, your majesty? growled Grigner. The prince went rigid as Grigner discerned him glazing over his shoulder. He swiveled. Swivelled. He swiveled to note the cause of the noble's attention, raised his sword over his head, and prepared to leash a vicious downward cleft, but fell short as the haft of a steel-rhymed pike clashed against his unguarded skull. The then blackness and solitude, silence and shrouding, and ever peaceful reigned supreme. Before me, Sirrah! Before me as always! Ha! Ha ha! Ha! Nobly cackled. Who... Who nobly cackle? How do you nobly cackle? I don't think that this is a noble action. I don't think you can do that nobly. You can bow in a noble way. You can shake hands in a noble way. You could, like, talk to some... Can you talk to someone nobly? Maybe if you're pretentious. You cannot cackle nobly. That's not a noble thing to do. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Before me, Sarah. Before me as always. Ha! Ha ha! Ha! Also, this isn't... This is like dying laughter or something. I don't know what... It would be ha 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 ha, right? You want more ha's. Cleft, really? Yeah, really cleft. Yeah. He raised the sword over his head and prepared to leash a vicious downward cleft. Because this is the appropriate way to use a term for hitting someone. Yeah, absolutely. So this bizarre word choice is, at times, it like makes some minimal level of sense. The reader is able to interpret it. So it's clearly English. Uh, and then the rest of the time, it's just so bizarre that it does like impede someone from being able to, it's impenetrable. The like writing is impenetrable. There are so many adjectives that these sentences just stretch on and on. I would be very interested in seeing the like word count to sentence count ratio and just seeing how many like sentences or how many words per sentence we end up getting. Too many, far too many. A sentence, generally speaking, 10 words, 10 words or less. Keep sentences short. Readers do not have attention spans for more than about 10 words. Purple prose, indeed, yeah, very, very purple. So purple, I mean, that's why we're editing in purple here. Yep, purple prose all over the place. I learned that term only Thursday, that's a fun fact been editing for years and somehow I only learned the term purple prose on Thursday. The things I learn on Twitch. Consciousness returned, this is chapter three now, we're in chapter three. Consciousness returned to Grigner in stigmatic pools as his mind gradually cleared of the cobwebs cluttering its inner recesses, yet the Stygian cloud of charcoal ebony remained. An, in an incompatible shield of blackness enhanced by the bleak absence of sound. Absence. Like an abscess, but with more like incense in it. I don't know what a stigmatic pool of consciousness is. So when we're thinking of crafting a colorful description, when we're thinking of using purple prose, perhaps, in a way that isn't terrible, um, I don't know if that only refers to the terrible use of it, but if we want to describe something poetically, the number one thing we should be asking is, does this contribute at the very least to a feeling? What is the feeling that you get from reading this? And if the, re if the feeling is confusion, it's the wrong feeling. It's always the wrong feeling. You do not want to feel confused when you are reading. That's a bad feeling. So I, a stigmatic pool as his mind gradually cleared of the cobwebs cluttering its inner recesses. These are two contradictory images. On one hand, we have like flat pools. And on the other one, we have cobwebs everywhere. And I do not think cobwebs and pools are similar objects. And the Stygian cloud of charcoal ebony remained. Now we've got weird mine imagery, right? Charcoal, we're thinking of like dark, black, mine-like stuff that starts fires or whatever. We're thinking of charcoal. That's what charcoal is. 
and the Stygian clouds, so I guess we learned that word recently from the river Styx, of or relating to the river Styx here. I don't know why it's like, I guess that we're trying to say that it's hellish. Maybe he's just like in such a pool of confusion that it feels like hell. I got no words. He took all of the words. We, we need to be a little bit more sparing in our use of words. We can love words. We can have an affinity for words. And we can use a lot of words. There's so many words to use. Not this many. Too many words. Grigner's muddled brain reeled from the shock of the blow he had received to the base of his skull. The events leading to his predicament were slow to filter back to him. He dickered with the notion that he was dead, and had descended or sunk, however it may be, to the shadowed land beyond the aperture of the grave, but rejected this hypothesis when his memory sifted back within his grips. Wow. Wow. We went this whole way saying, and he thought about this, and we th he thought about it very intensely, very deeply, with this very, very rich imagery. But he sort of dismissed it really, really quickly when suddenly he could think again. Yeah, that was ridiculous. You've basically insulted your reader in doing this right here. Because essentially what we're saying is like, I'm going to occupy your time and mental energy to picture all of these things. And then I'm going to say none of that was important and you actually just wasted your time. This is the important thing. We don't want to do that. This was not the land of the dead. Then why did we describe it for so long like it was? It was something infinitely more precarious than anything the grave could offer. Death promised an infinity of peace, not the finite misery of an inactive life of confined torture, forever concealed from the life-bearing shafts or the beloved rising sun. The orb that had been before taken for granted, yet now cherished above all else. To be forever refused further glimpses of the snow-capped summits of the land of his birth, never again to witness the thrill of plundering unexplored lands beyond the crest of a bleeding horizon, and perhaps worst of all, the denial to ever again encompass the lustful excitement of caressing the naked curves of the body of a trim, young wench. Assuming that's a typo. It's not yund. A description doesn't evoke an image to the mind. And yeah, it doesn't. We get no images from a lot of this. We have this, by using such bizarre words, we've like negated the meanings of any of them. When we keep saying the like Stygian dark coal, it's like we're picture, we picture the river Styx, if we know what the word Stygian means. Um, and then suddenly we picture dark coal. And like those two images are not like compatible like why are they together the orb that had been before taken for granted yet i think i think he's describing the sun that seems like it but we've used orb in so many contexts now we used it for eyes and then we described them as ovals and then we described people's heads as ovals we're back to shapes again and now we have an orb that had been taken for granted i'm assuming the sunshine because he'll be forever refused it. And worst of all, the denial to ever again encompass the lustful excitement. Just like we could say this so directly and so well, all we have to say is, and worse yet, he would never again feel the body of a naked woman again, right? Like the, he can just say that directly. Also, he's a barbarian. He does not think in these like intensely descriptive modes. That would be weird. It'd be weird to think that a barbarian, because when we define a barbarian, like when we think of what, like who is a barbarian, the kind of person in that word, we are thinking of somebody who's simpler, probably like, like they're not going to be as refined in the customs of, you know, developed society. Their customs are probably going to be in some way simpler. They're not going to do things just to please people. Probably they're going to do things that make sense for them to do that. Maybe um, they just they go and get their food and they didn't realize, that, oh, I can't just take food. I have to pay for it. Right. Things like that. Those are bar those. We would be like, that's barbaric. And maybe if they're like super barbarian. If we're really leaning hard into this, maybe they're a bit more violent or they're a bit more physically aggressive. 
into the sort of caricature of what we picture a barbarian as implying. And we instead get this guy who has extremely long flowery descriptions of things in his head and like is musing philosophically at every object in the natural world. I don't know barbarians. Well, I don't, I don't know barbarians in the first place, but I could not even imagine a barbarian who would be like pictured as doing this. This was indeed one of the buried chasms of hell concealed within the inner depths of the palace's despised interior, a fearful ebony chamber devised to drive to the brinks of insanity the minds of the unfortunately condemned through the inapt solitude of a limbo of listless, dreary silence. The inapt solitude of a limbo of listless, dreary silence. Yep, that's a phrase now. I mean, same criticism for this. Um, this was indeed one of the buried chasms of hell. Okay. A fearful ebony chamber. Um, I don't know if this is telling here. If this is like, are we telling the reader you should be fearful of this chamber? Or if we are describing the ebony chamber as a place within which one feels Fearful. Are we using this as an adjective to describe the place? Or are we trying to import the feeling onto the reader? Of course, either way, we would cut it anyway, because there are more effective ways to do each of those things. But, like, the... It devised... Like, the way that we're describing this, it devised to drive to the brinks of insanity, the minds of the unfortunately condemned. The tone of this sentence is also very, very strange. The minds of the unfortunately condemned... We have like a commentary going on at the same time that we're trying to describe it as this terrifying place. A tightly rung elliptical circle or torches. What? Of, of, of torches. A tightly rung elliptical circle of torches cast their wavering shafts prancing morbidly over the smooth surface of a rectangular ridged altar. 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 That's how it's pronounced. It's, how it's set. the Spelled. It's not pronounced that way. Altar. But otherwise it means to alter. It's the verb. Um, oh my goodness. Prancing morbidly. Okay, so they, the torches cast their wavering shafts. I don't know why they're wavering. Like, are the torches moving? Um, prancing morbidly. So they are prancing. The torches are moving over the smooth surface of a rectangular ridged altar. Oh, and by the way, we were definitely right. There are more shapes. We got more shapes. I'm so happy. This is actually just a story about shapes. We had the ovals, we had the orbs. Now we have the rectangular. We have an elliptical. We have an elliptical circle. We have an elliptical circle. It's like a circle, but it's stretched like an ellipse, which definitely does not make it an ellipse. It makes it an elliptical circle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't question this writer's command over words but the prose is very weak regardless of the words less is more in my mind at least as a Hemingway aligned mind woo shapes yeah less is more definitely in most cases in almost all cases less is always more um, it's we have we have a lot of the more here and not so much of the less we need much more of the less we need more less that's what I would that's how I would sum up my advice for that. More or less, I'd be like, more, less. And then I would send it back to them. I would postmark it with no return address. Expertly chiseled forms of grotesque gargoyles graced the oblique rim of pro protuberating, pro protuberating. Oh my goodness, protuberating. Protuberating. No. That's, there's no way that's a word. Protuberating. Is that a word? No. No, it's not. Protuberate is sometimes misspelled and mispronounced as if it were protuberate. Whatever. This is stupid. It's not a word. I don't care if it is a word. It's not a word. What is this communicating? Expertly chiseled forms of grotesque gargoyles graced the oblique rim, protuberating the length of the grim orifice of death 
staring forever ahead into nothingness in complete ignorance of the bloody rites enacted in their presence. Brown flaking stains decorated the golden surface of the ridge surrounding the altar, which banked to a small slit at the lower right-hand corner of the altar. He spelled it right after spelling it wrong twice. Why? The slit stood above a crudely pounded pail, which had several silver-meshed chalices hanging at its sides, dangling at the rim of golden mallet, the handle of which was engraved with images of twisted faces and groved at its far end with slots designed for a snug hand grip. The head of the mallet was slightly larger than a clenched fist and shaped into a smooth oval mass. Yay, shapes. So many shapes. Shapes are fun, guys. Honestly, if you are, so one of the things they tell you if you're trying to draw something is they try to tell you to like see things in shapes. I think that guy took that advice a little bit too far in his, he was probably trying to craft the illustrations for this. And somebody was like, dude, you need to think of it like shapes. You see shadows in people's faces. That's a triangle. That's a square. That's a rectangle. And now he sees the world only in circular ellipses, ovular ovals. Face orbs. The ig So what's odd is like the picture that we're getting here of this dark room or this like altar, which he somehow spelled correctly once after spelling it wrong twice, meaning he, he learned the spelling of the word in between there. Won't dwell on it. The, the image we're getting for this is we have gargoyles around this room we have this altar and clearly bad stuff happens here this is where they sacrifice humans the bloody rites enacted in their presence but apparently these gargoyles are staring on into the nothingness the the tone that this conveys is like everything's dark and grim and scary and intentionally so Except for the things that aren't intentionally participating in this. The gargoyles are just sort of staring off into the abyss. They don't really care about it. It's a weird, like, dichotomy of tones. He also has, like, weirdly sexual words that he keeps throwing in everywhere. I wouldn't have picked this up if we didn't have the word lustful thrown around 3,000 times in the last chapter. It was only thrown around probably, like, four or five times. But way too many times for one chapter. And now we have the word slit here, which just like, after we had the word slut and we had the word lustful and lustrous and mm, I don't want to give benefit of the doubt on this one. I'm getting the sense that this guy's a little bit Freudian in how he writes. And circling, right now he's got circles, ovals, and slits on the mind. That's what I'm thinking. And circling the marble altar was a congregation of leering shaman. Leering. Eerie chants of a bygone age originating unknown eons before the memory of man were being uttered from the buried recesses of the acolyte's deep lings. L lungs. 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 Orange paint was smeared in generous globules over the tops of the priests' wrinkled, shaven scalps, while golden rings projected from the lobes of their pink ears. Just say they were earrings. Ornate robes of... Lus, I, I don't know how to say that. Of luscure purple satin? Lusher? Lus, luscure. Oh, oh, I don't know how to say it because it's not a word. That's why. Okay. Luscious purple satin enclosed their bulging torsos, attached around their waists with silvered silk lashes, latched with ebony buckles in the shape of morose, misshaped skulls. Dangling around their necks were oval-fashioned medallions held by thin gold chains, featuring in their centers blood-red rubies, which resembled crimson fetish eyeballs. <laughs> what are we reading? Crimson fetish eyeballs? Yep, no, this is... this is super... Bygone age, memory of man, really? Really, yeah, this guy's serious about this. The, the, the bygone age and the memory of man. But how would they know they have ears? <laughs> yes. 
I mean, you've got to you've got to tell them about the ears before you can tell them about the earrings hanging on the ear, right? Every not every person knows that humans tend to have ears, so we have to describe the ears in detail and then describe what's hanging off of them. We can't say earrings; not everybody knows that term. It's very you know, it's very like American twentieth century. So instead, what we've got to say is the uh, the ear loopies, the golden ear loopies hanging out with their ovular shapes. Um, I, I don't know what a crimson fetish eyeball is. It's like a normal eyeball, but one that you fetishize. Am I like reading? I, I don't know if like, I, maybe I just don't have as amazing English skills. Like maybe, maybe I didn't know that words could be used in this way. I definitely didn't. I definitely didn't know that words could be used in this way. I'm wondering how much of this is a me problem cushioning their bare feet or plush red felt slippers with pointed golden spikes projecting from their tips. Why? This is the other thing that sort of like bugs me a lot in fantasy and sci-fi novels. Um, when you when you add something in for effect, it's totally fine to add something in for effect, something that you think is cool, but just make sure that these are things that wouldn't like be impractical, right? Like, if we have shoes with spikes on them, it's not necessarily bad that there would be spikes on them, but it is weird. You'd have to ask yourself, why would these shoes come to exist in this way? So, maybe there was some kind of weird push for fashion. Maybe it's because of the material. They originally made them out of horns, and so shoes had this kind of tip, and everybody was like, oh, I think that that style's really cool. So even when they stopped making the shoes out of horns, they made them with a material that, and they still did the tip, right? That's something that the, the style carries on some kind of legacy. You don't have to explain this to your reader, um, but... Sometimes, if you do too many cool things in the book that seem like they exist for that reason, when you do another one, like um, spikes projecting from the tips of their shoes, you just get a reader like me who would go like, why would they do that? Why would they wear that? Why does this fashion come around? Um, and the maybe if, if we've done so many of them, they're less inclined, that reader is less inclined to give a good faith interpretation and say, oh, Maybe it because, you know, fashion like descended through the ages and they suddenly got shoes with tips like this uh, and instead just go, this is probably silly. Situated in front of the altar and directly adjacent to the copper pail, we're suddenly using very academic language here. Situated in front of the altar and directly adjacent to the copper pail was, were we told there was a copper pail in this room? Copper pail. I'm looking specifically for copper pail. If we were not told there's a copper pail in this room, how is this a useful description? We were not told. Okay. Yep. So just randomly. There's also a copper pail there, and we are orienting our entire description of the room around this copper pail. Situated in front of the altar and directly adjacent to the copper pail was a massive jade idol, a misshaped hideous bust of the shaman's pagan deity. The shimmering green idol was placed in a sitting posture in an ornately carved golden throne raised upon a round, ivory-plated dais, it bulging arms and webbed hands resting on the padded arms of the seat. Its head was entwined in golden snake-like coils hanging over its oblong ears, which tapered off to thin hollow points. Its nose was a bulging triangular mass. We got a triangle. I'm so happy. We have every shape. This really is a shape thing. This whole thing is just like a weird, sexual, fetishized shape thing. Its nose was a bulging triangular mass sunken in at its sides with two gaping nostrils. Dramatic beneath the nostrils was a twisted, shaggy-lipped mouth, giving the impression of a slavering, sadistic grimace. Slavering? Not the worst thing wrong with it. So, this description, a lot of it, the actual feedback that we would have for this author, in addition to everything else, we need descriptions, not only that are clear, but that are 
um, the ways that people would see them. This is description for the sake of description, telling us everything in this room, around the room, near the room. The character would not see everything exactly like this. That's ridiculous. We don't sit there dialoguing which actions, like internally, we walk into a new room and we go, okay, there's a copper pail. Next to the copper pail is the altar. Next to the altar is the man in the robes. Around the room, there are gargoyles. They're all around the room and they're staring off into the abyss, the darkness, like they don't even care about the sacrificing. By the way, there's blood on the floor. There's blood all over the floor. That's important to note. We don't do that because that would be weird. We walk into a room and the first thing we go is like, Oh my god, there's blood everywhere. There's blood all over this room. That's a thing to notice. There's an altar too. Okay, people are being sacrificed in this room. And are those gargoyles? This is weird. What's going on here? And then you start hearing the chanting of the creepy people. Like, you just don't describe everything. You're not going to. You might say that the people are wearing robes. You're not going to tell us the colors of every object in the room. Um, and people aren't, like, readers don't have... They don't have the RAM for this. <laughs> like... Like, the average reader doesn't have, like, the, like, yeah, like, computer memory, like, RAM, like, random access memory, the ability to just retain this and process all of this information and process it into an image and see it and retain that for the entirety of the scene. They don't have that ability. When we give them colors, we want to give them, like, one color. This is the important one. There was a jade statue, okay? That's the only color I'm asking you to remember here. Oh, and blood. There's blood everywhere. But you know what color blood is, so I don't have to tell you. Most things should be self-explanatory. If you want to say something, you know, was royal, or it was, um, you can you can give them a little bit more to go on for some imagery. This is just so much. There's too much going on here, and the shapes are very bizarre. I don't know why we're describing everything with shapes. Triangular mass, the oblong ears, the circular ellipses. I get the sense that this may have been written by a geometry teacher. At the foot of the heathen deity, at the foot of the heathen deity, a slender, pale-faced female. <laughs> Back to the females, guys. <laughs> a slender, pa pale-faced female, naked, but for a golden, jeweled harness, enshrouding her huge, outcropping breasts. <laughs> okay. Supporting long silver laces which extended to her thigh, stood before a pearl-white field with noticeable shivers traveling up and down the length of her exquisitely molded body. A pearl-white field? Where did the field come from? Aren't we in a dark room? What of this have I been picturing incorrectly? So I guess there's a field now. Yeah, the heathen deity, indeed. Yeah, at the foot of the heathen deity. The guy, I guess, like, maybe maybe he's like... But if this is from the barbarian's perspective, like, for him... I guess, okay, I guess it makes sense. He sees If he sees another religion practicing, and it's not his religion as a barbarian, maybe he's like, ah, the heathen god. It's still a weird phrase to use, heathen deity. What have we accomplished after three paragraphs? This is description for the sake of it. Indeed, it is raw description for the sake of it. It is description because this guy likes words, and he wants to convey to you that he likes a lot of words. There are so many words that he likes. If you were to ask him what his favorite words are, he would be like oblong, ellipses, circle, argon, like just endlessly. Jade, pale-faced female. And I... This is so weird. His placement of the word female is bizarre. Um outcropping breasts i don't know what to say about that i she, that this is what i'd say about it uh, i don't really have a whole lot of it's fine to describe like especially if we're given this male character who is a barbarian there are ways that we can signal their their barbarism to other people to the audience we can we can show how much they just sit there ogling at women's breasts. If that's the way that we really want to communicate this to the audience, I would probably advise in the current day and age having a character who is like that. But because they're just gross, not necessarily because like there's anything like wrong with the writing because it's gross um, and it's just not going to be a character that people like. Um, but that said, maybe that's what we're going for. Um, this is like a, this is such a weird way to do it. 
he wouldn't describe it like this. Like he would, he'd just be like, she had huge breasts, right? He's not gonna be like, she, and shrouding her huge outcropping breasts. It goes back to his like the weird tone that we've set up with this, where this bar, this um, this barbarian is not behaving like one. He's not seeing things like it. Her delicate lips trembled beneath soft, narrow hands as she attempted to conceal herself from the piercing stare of the ambivalent idol. The ambivalent idol. So it's like a very impassioned idol. From the piercing stare of the... Okay, whatever. Don't know what's going on here. Uh, again, all of this, we just... Glaring down towards her was the stony cycloptic <laughs> what is the stony cycloptic face of the bloated deity, gaping from its single oblong socket, was scintillating many f faceted scarlet emerald, many faceted scarlet emerald, a brilliant gem seeming to possess a life of all of its own, a priceless gleaming stone capable of domineering the wealth of conquering empires. The Eye of Argon. Um, if you got anything from that description of it, a scintillating, many-fauceted scarlet emerald, a brilliant gem. Um, I don't, like, you are impressive. That would be, that would be an impressive feat to get anything out of that description. I don't, is that supposed to be many-faced or something? Many-fauceted. Okay, so we finally met the Eye of Argon. That's what's important. We've discovered why this book is called the Eye of Argon after only three and a half chapters. <laughs> what is this? What is, what? Okay, whatever. Three and a half chapters. <laughs> Did we have a chapter three and a chapter three and a half? Did I not notice this? Where was chapter three? Two. Okay, there's two. And... Three. We did. We had three, three and a half. I applaud the um, breaking from form. Definitely. If we want to... Um, if we want to break from form here and do... Half chapters? I really hope we have a chapter four and a half. Okay, where were we? Four. All knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner. That's knowledge. Oh, the title drop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right there. Bam. Yeah, th that's what I was thinking. Many faceted. Like, does this title or does this, um, does this emerald just have like sink heads coming out of it. That's exactly what I pictured. Um, so finally, we've met the reason for the title. Yay. Um, all knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner. This sentence is impressive for how dumb it is. Like, there are sentences in this that are kind of ridiculous and by kind of very ridiculous, but I'm trying to like tone it down just a little bit so that my criticism sounds a little bit more helpful. Um, as if we were pretending that I was actually editing this for a real person um, and not just for entertainment. But this sentence, even in the context of this ridiculous story, all knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner, is ridiculous in so many new ways because it presumes that this is a thing, this is a piece of knowledge that people have. All knowledge of measuring time. Of course, in my head, right next to the amygdala, that's where I keep all of my knowledge for measuring time. And that part is what short-circuited in Grigner right here. And he just forgot what seconds, minutes, hours were. And, of course, he forgot how to measure time and what even the measurement of time would be. This is just weird. It's weird to say in this way because that's not how we think of measuring time as, like, a piece of knowledge that people have. All knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner. Also, it's very passive. I don't know why we're describing it passively. It had escaped Grigner. We don't want to be passive. We want to be active, engaging, etc. So we would say something like, um, I don't know, Grigner couldn't even tell how much time passed. 
There you go. There's a normal, natural way to say this. When a person is deprived of the sun, moon, and stars, he loses all conception of time as he had previously understood it. The, 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 the loose, lose problem actually doesn't bother me that much, but I do enjoy making fun of it. It doesn't bother me that much because there was a time when I was much younger, and it did indeed seem like the natural way to spell the word. You really wanted to add that extra O for lose. It feels better. Oh yeah. Time anti-real to Gur gets a flat circle. Huh? Time anti-real. Not quite sure what that means, but yeah. Yeah, this is um This is fun. Okay. So all knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner. When a person is deprived of the sun, moon, and stars, he loses all conception of time as he had previously understood it. It seemed as if... Also, we're just telling that to the reader now. Like, we have now exited Grigner's perspective. It is now third-person omniscient. And we're just telling the reader how it feels when you are deprived of the sun, moon, and stars. Turns out you lose all conception of time. All of it. You don't get the sense that time is taking an eternity because that's probably what would really happen, right? You'd be sitting there in this endlessly dark room like, oh my God, I can't even tell how much time is passing. I just feel like I'm going insane. So much time must be passing, right? But it's only been like 30 seconds. No, instead what we have is you've lost all conception of time. Time itself is elusive to you. What is time? And so it's probably a short time, right? He's probably enjoying himself. It seemed as if years had passed if time were being measured by terms of misery and mental anguish. Indeed, that is exactly how it would be being measured here. That's how you would measure it. Yet he estimated that his stay had only been a few days in length. Why would he estimate that? He has no conception of time. He would only measure it in terms of mental anguish and misery, and he would think that it had been an eternity. Years had passed. This is... This, like, and on top of that... Now we've exited the third person omniscient. Bam! Right here we went right into it seemed as if. We, we now get the character's perspective. Don't switch tones. <laughs> he had slept three times and had been fed five times since his awakening in the crypt. However, when the actions of the body are restricted, its needs are also affected. Back to the omniscient here. Unless Grigner is sitting here telling us, like... Turns out he's actually aware that he's in a story. This has been metafiction the whole time. The need for nourishment and slumber are directly proportional to the... F <laughs> okay, get ready for the mathematical formula, okay? The need for nourishment and slumber. So nourishment, this is the need for nourishment and slumber, plus slumber. Or it's probably the need for slumber, right? So it's going to be like need slumber is directly proportional to the functions the body has performed, directly proportional to um, bodily functions. There we go. This is our mathematical formula. Although if it's directly proportional, we probably actually have like a multiplication right here going on. So, okay. This is a weird thing to suddenly throw in. Directly proportional is very mathematical language. This is a thing that would only be common in the present day. You wouldn't describe things like this from the barbarian's mindset in 4th century or whatever time period this is supposed to sort of approximate. Now, of course, this is supposed to be a sci-fi, but we have had no setup for any kind of like what the sci-fi-like world would be. And yeah, it's, it's just bizarre. It's bizarre to suddenly throw in a phrase like directly proportional. It'd be like if, you know, you just suddenly throw in something about logarithms or like derivative. Like it would be odd. It's a very modern way of describing things. Meaning that when free and active Grigner may become hungry every... The need... Okay, we're going to start at the beginning of the sentence again. The need for nourishment and slumber are directly proportional to the functions the body has performed. Meaning that when free and active Grigner may become hungry if every six hours and witness the desire for sleep every 15 hours, where he is in his present condition, he may encounter the need for food every 10 hours and the want for rest every 20 hours. So I, 
I thought I might have been running ahead of myself a little bit by putting up a mathematical equation for this, but indeed, they described it with scientific language here. Grigna may become hungry every six hours and witness the desire for sleep every 15 hours, whereas in his present condition, he may encounter the need for food every 10 hours and the want for rest every 20 hours. This is so specific, and he has no conception of time. We've already contradicted our own description of his, of his feeling here. Every 20 hours, every 10 hours, this is so weird. This is, this is super bizarre. All methods he had before depended upon, all methods he had before depended upon were extinct in the dismal pit. Hence, henceforth, hence, he may have been imprisoned for 10 minutes or 10 years. He did not know, resulting in a disheartened emotion deep within his being. This is so scientific. I feel like a, like a science researcher came out and like clinically studied the barbarian and then went to, ah, his eating patterns. Every five hours, this man rushes for food. Every 10 hours, he desires to sleep. But what if we turn the lights off? If we put him in a room where the lights cannot shine, suddenly we discover that his sleep cycles have been disrupted. They're running experiments on him. This is my new theory. My new theory for this is that this is actually a big human exper uh, experiment. He was let out of the lab. That's why it's a sci-fi. I hope that that's the case. This was sci-fi, yeah. Yeah, it's like going to Vegas. <laughs> the food, if you can honor the moldering lumps of fetid mush to that extent, was borne to him by two, by two guards who opened a portal at the top of his enclosure and shoved it to him in wooden bowls, retrieving the food and water bowels from his previous meal at the same time, after which they threw back the bolts on the iron latch and returned to their other duties. So, um... By screwing up, word choice especially matters. But by screwing up the word bowls here, I'm assuming they would come back to collect the bowls. Um, but perhaps they did come back and collect his bowel movements. <laughs> um, that is an impressive one to mess up. Since deprived of all other means of nourishment, Grigner was impelled to eat the tainted slop in order to war off the pangs of starvation, though as he stuffed it into his mouth with his filthy fingers and struggled to force it down his throat, he imagined it was that which had been spurned by the hounds stationed at various segments of the palace. I imagine that this, if this were recorded with like a woman's voice and more like the, the quiet ASMR type, then we would actually not be allowed to read this on Twitch. Um, I, I imagine that that would get someone TOS'd out of Twitch for reading this in a sexy voice. So I'd like to see someone try it. That would be fun to see if it can make it through. There was, a, there was little in the barren vault that could occupy his body or mind. He had paced out the length and width of the enclosure time and time again. He's got a way of measuring time right there. Bam. The human pace is equivalent to about one step every second. Whatever. Um, length and width of the enclosure time and time again and tested every granite slab which consisted the walls of the prison in hopes of finding a hidden passage to freedom, all of which was to no avail other than keeping him busy and distract his mind from wandering to thoughts of what he believed was his future. If you can't read a sentence in one breath, bad, bad sign. He had memorized the number of strides from one end to the other of the cell and knew the exact number of slabs which made up the bleak dungeon. Numerous schemes were introduced and alternately discarded in turn as they secured to unravel him as, as they, I don't know, what is that word? Whatever. As they secured to unravel to him no means of escape, which stood the slightest chance of success or success. Um, okay. I need a recap of the plot that we've got going on in this, in this work so far. So we've got a dude, we've got a... Um, we've got a barbarian, Grigner. Grigner's a barbarian way back 
in the beginning, he was fighting with some soldiers. We don't know why he was fighting with some soldiers, but that was a thing happening. He's fighting with some soldiers. They had some dialogue exchange, and then he's like, whoa, I'll go without a struggle. Oh, no, and then he, he finds a prostitute. Then he gets attacked by some guards. I'll go without a struggle, man. They take him to the palace room for some reason. Natural thing the guards do and somehow don't get fired for it. And the prince is like, I want him in prison. No, actually, I want him working the mines. Ha ha ha. Because I'm so evil. They send him down into these vaults. And in these vaults, um, his mind is slowly being driven insane. And um, then now he's pacing his cell. Oh, and let's see, where did the Eye of Argon appear? The foot, oh right, he wandered into the torture room. He was taken there. Right, and then he sees the Eye of Argon. Capable of domineering the wealth of conquering empires. Oh, maybe th this is probably supposed to be or, or conquering empires, right? Capable of domineering the wealth. I mean, I don't know what domineering wealth is. I just assume that he meant dominating the wealth or something. Or conquering empires, the Eye of Argon. Okay, whatever. It, it's a powerful stone. He sees it there. And that imagery was very confusing. Now he's still back in the vault trying to distract himself. He's pacing his cell and he's counting the stones on the floor. I see you lurking there. Thanks for the, uh, the emote. That's uh, a Tunch Lurk Pencil. Interesting. How's it going, Mez? So, yeah. That, um... What a disaster. Okay. The food. Oh, we, we read that one. Okay, so we are down now. He is impelled to eat. He imagined it was that which had been spurned by the dogs. Even the dogs wouldn't eat this. There was little in the barren vault that could occupy his body or mind. He'd paced out. We got that. And he memorized the number of stripes. And he has consistently been scheming. Of course, he's a barbarian. His schemes are very elaborate, though. Anguish continued to mount as his means of occupation were rapidly exhausted. Suddenly, without no tithe... <laughs> Suddenly, without no tithe, he was routed from his contemplations as he detected a faint scratching sound at the end of the crypt opposite him. The sound seemed to be caused by something trying to scrape away at the granite blocks of the floor of the enclosure. Oh, of the, 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 the sound seemed to be caused by something trying to scrape away at the granite blocks the floor of the enclosure consisted of. A sandy scratching of something like an animal's claws. Grigner gradually groped his way to the other end of the vault, carefully feeling his way along with his hands ahead of him. First of all, that is what groped should have meant in that sentence. So he not only used the wrong word and then went on to tell us how we were supposed to picture it, but also he used the wrong word. You usually do not grope uh, anything. Actually, just don't grope anything ever. Don't grope things. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a fair... That's a fair prescription. Let's just not grope things. But walls, we usually don't grope. Um, odd. When a few inches from the wall, a loud penetrating squeal and the scampering of small padded feet reverberated from the walls of the roughly hewn chamber. Hone chamber. Okay. Um, so this is a chamber that is made of stone. This is a chamber made of like brick and stone. And somehow... Sound is reverberating off of it, and also he can hear the scampering of small padded feet reverberating through the walls. I don't think that sound would ver reverberate. In fact, I don't think you would hear it through the walls at all. But you definitely would not hear it reverberating. And it's a few inches from the wall, a loud penetrating squeal. Penetrating is, is a very weird word to throw in here. I'm the the like my theory that this is like Freudian writing is is slowly I think 
becoming more and more severe. That is, it's it's less of like a prediction or or some kind of theory and more of a judgment. Grigner threw his hands up to shield his face and flung himself backwards upon his buttocks. <laughs> you can't use that word seriously. Buttocks. A fuzzy form bounded to his hairy chest, burying its talons in his flesh while gnashing toward his throat with its grinding white teeth, its sour fetid breath, scorching the squirming barbarian's dilating nostrils. Grigner grappled with the lashing flexor muscles of the repugnant body of a, gar of a gargantuan brown-hided rat, striving to hold its razor teeth from his juicy jugular as its beady gray organs of sight <laughs> glazed into the flaring emeralds of its prey. Okay, I really thought he couldn't have done better before with the, like, eye orbs or whatever he described. This is remarkable. His juicy jugular and its beady gray organs of sight. Beady gray organs of sight. I think forever we should only describe eyes this way. Beady gray organs of sight. And it's flaring emeralds. These are so contradictory. Like, they, they don't give a picture that makes sense. If we're going to give adjectives for so many different things, we want those adjectives to convey an image together. We want them to work together. So, perhaps, if, for some reason, we were going to give this many adjectives, we want them to be operating in, like, synchrony. That's not a word. Maybe it is. Whatever. We want them to be operating together. And so what we might do, for instance, if we want a person to seem volatile, perhaps we describe them like fire and we say that their their eyes were their eyes burned red and um while well, their muscles flared and their no or their nostrils flared and their their muscles roared up, something like that, and we're conveying that this person is like a giant ball of fire ready to burst. And instead here we have a juicy jugular, beady gray organs of sight that are glazing into the flaring emeralds. We have fire. We have whatever beady gray organs of sight is and a juicy jugular on top of its razor teeth. I don't know whether to laugh at this thing or be afraid of it. It's supposed to be a gargantuan brown hided rat or a gargantuan. I mean, maybe that, like, is some kind of alien-like race, the Garganuans. It's probably gargantuan, though. Oof. Oof, oof, oof. Yeah, juicy glazing, now I'm hungry. Allow. Um, yeah, there's so much. There's so much of the sex stuff. It's so weird. Um, very painful. Yep, all the, all the groping and penetrating, just... This guy definitely had something on the mind as he was writing this, and none of it was his sci-fi plot. Um, as evidenced by the fact that I'm still not sure we've hit a plot yet. Um, I am, like, we're, we're four chapters in? Are we four chapters in now? And we're still not sure, I'm not sure what this is about. This should have been, like, and this is a novella. So it's not like we, it's not like, you know, we've got 10 chapters of setup to get into the real book. We shouldn't have 10 chapters of setup to get into any book. But for a novella, we should have been set up from the get-go. This should have been chapter one. We know what's happening. We know who the hero is. I don't know if this guy is a hero yet because we keep describing him as a massive pervert. And then on top of that, like, it's not clear what this plot is going to be. Is this plot, like, against the king? Does he have some motivation? What are the motivations of this guy? Like, what's he, what does he exist for? Where did he come from? We're just given this barbarian who's been thrust into the middle of the society and is now fighting people because he's a barbarian and I guess they would fight guards. And then he's taken off to jail. And for some reason, we're supposed to think that that's a bad thing. We're supposed to want, I would, I would think, I would assume, we want Grigner to escape. Um, but I'm kind of fine with him just being in jail. Like, as a reader, I, I think maybe their society benefits from it. 
Taking hold of the rodent around its lean, growling stomach with its- why is it lean now? It had a juicy jugular. Oh wait, wait, no, that's- that's Grigner's juicy jugular. How is it lean though? Rats are- okay, maybe it's a starving rat. Maybe that's why it's attacking him. Okay. Taking hold of the rodent around its lean, growling stomach with both hands, Grigner pried it from his crimson rent breast. Removing small patches of flayed flesh from his chest in the motion between the squalid black claws of the starving beast. Holding the rodent at arm's length, he cupped his right hand over its frothing face, contracting his fingers into a vice-like fist over the quivering head. Retaining his grips on the rat, Grigner flexed out his outstretched arms while slowly twisting his right hand clockwise and his left hand counterclockwise motion. The rodent let out a tortured squall, drawing scarlet as it violently dug its foam-flecked fangs into the barbarian's sweating palm, causing his face to contort to an ugly grimace as he cursed beneath his breath. Breath. Okay. Um... Oof. Holding the rodent at arm's length, he cupped right hand over its frothing face. So this, this is clearly, this rat is rabid, right? The face is frothing. I think he means the mouth. The mouth should be what's frothing. But I guess maybe the rat's whole face is frothing. It's extremely rabid. And this guy's genius idea, I'm going to cup its mouth with my hand. Haha. <laughs> rabid rat can't bite my hand. Can't get rabies for my hand. Everybody knows that. I feel like this guy is like Andy from Parks and Rec. Like, that is the kind of Andy-like thinking I would be expecting. From Andy. Not from our titular hero, Grigner. Um, drawing Scarlet, of course. If you are writing so much about blood that you need a different word for blood, you can't use the word blood again because you've used the word blood too many times, and you have to use the word like scarlet, probably what has happened is you have talked too much about blood. Just say blood. Blood is a fine word to use. But if it's being repetitive, then probably we've written too much about blood. And we want to write a little bit less about that and a little more about something else. Yeah, this is indeed, this is really close to being like erotica. Yeah. Um, foam coming from its ears and everything. The plot is Grigner is the man you all want to be and he does awesome stuff. Indeed. Yeah, this is just like basically like a, like, it's just a testosterone raging man who's just like, I'm going to run after all of the women and I'm going to just kill all of the guards and then I'm going to get arrested and everybody should pity me because I've been arrested after I've done horrible things. So, um, I, he's actually then, I think he's just Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, right? Except mine is the part where Gaston is like, I don't, I don't know, liked by some people in the town a little bit or attractive. Maybe that's it. <laughs> With a loud crack, the rodent's head parted from its squirming torso, sending out a sprinking shower of crimson gore and trailing a slimy string of disjointed vertebra snapped trachea, esophagus, and jugular, disjointed hyoid bone, morose purpled stretched hide, and blood-seared muscles. What did he just do to this rat? That was like a Mortal Kombat x-ray move right here that he just did on this one rat. Jesus, we didn't get this level of violence from the guards who attacked him, and he just like, like, Oh my goodness. This is... This is a very violent scene. <laughs> Unnecessarily violent. Um, and also, I don't know how he... Like, this guy must be insanely strong to be able to not only snap its neck, but then, like, pull out its spine. Um, again, I'm not sure why this guy should be the protagonist does not seem like a good guy. I would not want this guy out of prison. So as an audience member right now reading this, I am actively rooting against this guy. Flinging the broken body to the floor, 
Grigner shook his blood-streaked hands and wiped them against his thigh until dry. As one does, right? You're not going to keep wiping them until it's wet again. Then wiped the blood that had showered his face and from his eyes. Again sitting himself upon the jagged floor, he prepared to once more revamp his glum meditations. He told himself that as long as he still breathed the gust of life through his lungs, hope was not lost. He told himself this, but found it hard to comprehend in his gloomy surroundings. Yet he was still alive. His bulging sinews at their peak of marvel, his struggling mind floating, in a morale of impressed excellence of thought. <laughs> his struggling mind floating in a morale of impressed excellence of thought. I don't know what a morale is, to be honest. Uh, my my own like linguistic ignorance is is coming out here. Either that, or he's tricking me into thinking that a number of these are words. One of them is happening. But to describe your own characters as an impressed excellence of thought, um, that is some, uh, that's some, uh, that's some horn tootin' right there. That's not horn tootin' of the character, that's horn tootin' of the author, because you are the one who authored the thoughts. You're going like, ha, my character is such a genius, what a, what an impressed excellence of thought is just coursing through his mind. Ah, so beautiful, if I could just stare at his thoughts all day. Nobody cares about thoughts when you're doing that. Like, this is just, this is such weird touting. Plot after plot sifted through his mind in energetic contemplations. Is this like, I think this is the author writing about himself. He was still alive, his bulging sinews at their peak of marvel. His struggling mind floating in a morale of impressed excellence of thought. This guy's just thinking so much good stuff about his story. Plot after plot sifted through his mind in energetic contemplations, and then he went with none of them and wrote about Grigner. Then it hit him. Minutes may have passed. In silent thought or days, he could not tell. If you can't tell the difference between minutes and days, like, a lot more has happened than putting you in a dark room. At this point, your mind is shot. You are, you are out of it. And that would be fine. It would be fine... If that was the case, but it's very clear he's having an impressed excellence of thought streaming through his mind. So, there's no way that his mind is so far gone that he can't tell the difference between a couple minutes and several days. But he stumbled at last upon a plan that he considered as holding a slight margin of plausibility. He might die in the attempt. But he knew he would not submit without a final bloody struggle. It was not a, fool a foolproof plan, yet it built up a store of renewed vortex energy in his overwrought soul. Though he might perish in the execution of the escape, he would still be escaping the life of infinite torture in store for him. Either way, he would still cheat the gloating prince of the succored revenge of his sadistic mind craved so dearly. Um, we have repeated more or less in three or four different ways how this plan is not foolproof, but it's genius. It's not foolproof. He could die, but it's also really, really good. It's not foolproof. He might perish, but he'd still be escaping the lifetime of infinite torture. Only held a slight margin of plausibility. We get it. We definitely got that. Yeah, um, Vortex Energy. Moral is not an English word. It's an Urdu and Hindi girl's name, though. Ah, okay. Thanks for... It's actually, that's a really pretty name. Um, thanks for looking that up for us. I'm so convinced now this is a parody. I don't think that this is... I don't think that this is a parody. I don't know. It could be. It's an impressive parody if it is parody. Um, I will say, like, I have never stumbled this much while reading a book because I keep thinking the next word will not be the next word. Um, the guards would soon come to bear him off to the prince's buried mines. Oh, we had a really weird use of the word born as well earlier. I didn't even comment on it because it was just like in the middle of all of this other weirdness, it was somehow less strange. But we had like two soldiers who born like food or something for him. Um, 
where did that go? It was so bizarre. Um, yeah, whatever. I think it was here. Ah, was born to him by two guards. Um, that is not how we... What they meant, of course, was like, like they... The, the the food was born on their backs or something like like they they bared it right they they that's obviously not the word but they they bared the the thing they were bearing the brunt of it or whatever um they were bearing gifts but was born means like ah oh, the food was born like like it emerged into the world from a person's body right like it was it was born that's just weird very weird like everything else here the guards would soon come to bear him off to the prince's buried mines of dread, giving him the sought-after opportunity to execute his newly formulated plan. Groping his way along the rough floor, Grigner finally found his tool in a pool of congealed gore, the carcass of the decapitated rodent, the tool that the very filth he had been sentenced to spawned. When the time came for action, he would have to be prepared, so he set himself to rending the sticky hulk in grim silence, searching by the touch of his fingertips for the lever to freedom. I don't know how big this rat was. It was very odd, the way that they described the rat. But we had a picture of this pretty big rat that he had, like, rest, like wrestled off of him, and he, like, snaps its neck and pulls out its spine, full Mortal Kombat x-ray move, throws it away from him. Ha, disgusting rat. And then he has to crawl over to the thing that he just threw, and he has to get this tool out of its, like, congealed muck. So the tool should be, if this isn't just randomly written, the tool should be one of the bones, or it should be some body part. If the tool is not one of the bones or a body part, if the tool is something that he found on the floor, he's like, ah, I found a lockpick just on the floor, then this is... Like, why did he throw it on the lockpick? Why did he throw the body on the lockpick? Right? It has to be a bone. I'm holding out hope that something will make sense in a moment. Up to the altar and be done with it, wench, ordered a fidgeting shaman as he gave the female. <laughs> There's them females again. <laughs> as he gave the female a grim stare accompanied by the wrinkling of his lips to a mirthful grin of delight. We're really loving this word here, mirthful. And mirth. It's just a lot of mirth. The girl burst. Finally, we have we have referred, we have finally referred to a female person without the word female. I think we said and wench. The girl burst into a slow, steady whimper, stooping shakily to her knees and cringing woefully from the priest with both arms wound snake-like around the bulging jade-jade shin rising before her scantily attired figure. Her face was redly inflamed from the salty flow of tears spouting from her glassy, dilated eyeballs. <laughs> eyeballs. There is not, I don't know if there's a single verb in this entire story that is not surrounded by adverbs. Stooping shakily, her steady whimper, although that's an adjective and a, and a noun, but regardless, it could have been steadily whimpering, cringing woefully, the bulging jade shin, oh, that, again, an adjective, but whatever, scantily attired, redly inflamed, redly's not even a real adjective. <laughs> wow. Her glassy dilated eyeballs. Her full eyeball dilated, not just her pupils, but her actual eyeball in its in her head got like bigger. Um, yeah. Oof. Woop woop woop. Yep. Yeah. Woop woop. With short, heavy footfalls, the priest approached the female. <laughs> His piercing. St oh my goodness! What was back up here? We had um. She's scantily attired, naturally. She's a woman in the story. All of them will be. Um, her face is redly inflamed from the salty flow of tears. So she's crying. And she's there's a bulging jade, jade, shin, rising before her. Is this priest about to kick her? No, does not appear so. So... 
I don't know why his shin is bulging. Um, this is this is uh this is an interesting image here, a bulging shin, rising before her. Something is bulging, rising before her. Don't worry, it's green. With short, heavy footfalls, the priest approached the female, his piercing stare never wavering from her quivering young countenance. Halting before the terrified girl, he projected his arm outward and motioned her to arise with an upward motion of his hand. That's how you, oh, upward movement of his hand. The girl's whimpering increased slightly, and she sunk closer to the floor rather than arising. Oh, she didn't follow his directions. Damn female. The flickering torches outlined her trim build with a weird ornate glow as it cast a ghostly shadow dancing in horrid waves of splendor over smoothly worn whiteness of the marble-hewn altar. Um, it's a weird ornate glow with a ghostly shadow dancing in hard waves of splendor. Everything's splendid. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is this is confusing. <laughs> like words mean things. Uh, when we use them like this, they cease to mean things. Um, and they don't even sound like they mean things here. It's a ghostly shadow dancing in horde waves. Okay, be afraid of it. Of splendor. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's joyful now. Everything's everything's great. Forget that it was horrid waves. They are now splendorous waves of a smoothly worn whiteness of the marble hewn altar. Okay, whatever. The shaman's lips curled back farther, exposing a set of blackened, decaying molars, which transformed his slovenly grin into a wide, greasy arc of sadistic mirth and alternately imposed into the female a strong sensation of stomach-curdling nausea. Have it as you will, female, gloated the enhanced priest as he bent over at the waist projecting his ape-like arms forward and clasped the female's slender arms with his hairy round fists. With an inward surge of his biceps, he harshly jerked the trembling girl to her feet and smothered her salty, wet cheeks with the moldy touch of his decrepit, dull red lips. That is disgusting. He has evoked a reaction. This is the first reaction that I feel was strongly evoked in me toward this writing. Um, and it is disgusting. This author would have been excellent at gore porn. Um, absolute, like, should have written horror. Would have rivaled Stephen King if he could just, like, get through the writing part and, like, using more verbs and making things happen. But basically, if we had written a story and used a lot of these words, we would have evoked a pretty horrific reaction from people. We have not done that. Well, we did. We did successfully do it right here for a short period of time. This is disgusting. This is probably the worst passage I've ever read. Like, worst as in, like, gave me the worst reaction. Um, I don't know why the priest is enhanced. Like, is he enhanced because, like, it, like technologically or something? I don't know what's happening here. As he bent over at the waist. Also, he bent over at the waist. I was expecting something a little bit different here. But then he and he projects his ape-like arms forward. And he clasps her. He's got hairy round fists. So, for once, the descriptions went together. <laughs> I was picturing an ape-like person. And then he gives us hairy round fists. And I'm like, ah, an ape-like person. Wonderful. With an inward surge of his biceps. Biceps, again, giving to that like ape-like image. That's good. He harshly jerked. The trembling girls were feet. Now, I don't know how this motion is working. This doesn't make sense. Like, like if we were going to choreograph this action here, she's on the ground, and she's cowering in fear, and the priest comes over, and he bends at his waist, and he's bending over, and then he grabs her, and he surges with his biceps. And somehow she's on her feet now. So it's clear to me that the author doesn't know how physics works here or human bodies or the way that human bodies bend. That's fine. We already had evidence of that. At least for once, we've been given a description that, like, 
echoes or it 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 vibes with itself further down the line. We were not told that he's ape-like and then that he's also tiger-like and then that he's also like a building or something like that. Instead, three ape-like adjectives, they all went together. Excellent. The rest of it is terrible still. But moldy touch. Why are his lips moldy? Jesus. The vile stench of the shaman's hot, fetid breath came over the nauseated female with a deep, soul-searing sickness, causing her to wrench her head backwards and regurgitate a slimy, orange-white stream of swelling gore over the richly woven purple robe of the enthused acolyte. The priest's lips trembled with a malicious rage as he removed his callous paws from the girl's arms and replaced them with tightly around her undulating neck, shaking her violently to and fro. The girl gasped a tortured groan from her clamped lungs, her sea-blue eyes bulging forth from damp sockets. Cocking her right foot backwards, she leashed it desperately outwards with the strength of a demon possessed, lodging her sandaled foot squarely between the shaman's testicles. <laughs> okay. We got through all of this without laughing. And then we hit testicles, and I couldn't hold it in anymore. Okay. Um, still ridiculous, all of this, as we would expect at this point. If we expected anything not to be ridiculous at this point, um, sorely out of luck. I don't know what to tell you. But um, a tortured groan, her clamped lungs. I don't know what a clamped lung is. This is this is odd. We've just got some, it's still some odd word choice here. At least we called eyes eyes this time. That is good. This deserves plus mark or some kind of happy face or something. I don't know. Bulging forth from damp sockets would have corrected that. Cocking her right foot backwards. I don't know why we used this word here. This is so weird. How do you cock your foot? You can cock a gun. I guess you could maybe cock a fist. But like, you don't, like it just is weird. It's weird to cock your foot backwards. Just say she kicked him. She lodged her foot squarely. Even this would have been fine. She lodged her foot sandaled you don't want sandal you don't need sandal she lodged her sandal in fact you'd say she lodged her sandal you don't need her foot her sandaled foot she lodged her sandal squarely between the shaman's testicles now uh, between the shaman's testicles is extremely specific um usually when you see this action from a good distance like our character probably is you do not see the individual testicles being hit in between very odd um so probably just Kicked him squarely in the testicles. Would have been fine. I am happy. Finally, we have another shape. Squarely. I am very happy at the shapes that we are accumulating. We had a triangle. We had a square at this point. We've also had a rectangular thing. The altar was rectangular. Um, and we have had circles and ellipses. Um, and ovals. And orbs. So we are covering all of the shapes so far. Um, and I am very impressed that the author is managing to fit them in. So far, this is reading to me like a challenge. Somebody wrote this like it was a challenge to get in as many different kinds of words as possible. And somebody gave him like, like a Mad Libs list of words. And he just inserted them in random places. They did not always fit. Lustfully was one of the words on there that was like six times. Oh my goodness. Between, yeah, exactly. Yeah, between the testicles. Yeah. Oof. Someday you have to do My Immortal. I don't know if I can do that on on stream. If I am able to do that, somebody help me with like understanding the Twitch terms of service or something like that. I would love to do My Immortal. I think that would be hilarious. But I also don't want to like whatever, step on things there. Um, but yeah, that'd be hilarious. Um, there is a game around this book where you read and when you laugh, you drink. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good. I would not be able to get through like I think the first sentence. Um, Clearly, I think I've already demonstrated that. <laughs> the startled priest released his crushing grip, crimping his body over at the waist, overlooking his recessed belly, wide open in a deep chasm. His face flushed to a rose-red shade of crimson, eyelids fluttering wide with the eyeballs protruding blindly outwards from their sockets to their outmost perimeters, while his lips quivered wildly about allowing an agonized wallow to gush forth as his breath billowed from burning lungs. His hands reached out, clutching his urinary gland. <laughs> clutching his urinary gland as his knees wobbled rapidly for about for a few seconds, then buckled. 
causing the ruptured shaman to collapse in an egg huddled mass to the granite pavement, rolling helplessly about in his agony. We had about several times in there, and I thought we were about to get like a um about uh, I thought we were about to get a uh prepositional phrase, and it but it's like he was rolling about. It was very confusing. His end in structure was odd. Um, and we didn't have a lot of like commas and stuff to separate some of these introductory phrases. So technically, obviously that'd be a thing to fix. But um, beyond that, I mean, this action is so slow. We have like two paragraphs here. In these two paragraphs, it will it will be surprising to hear that this guy has only been kicked and he's only reacted to the kick. That's it. Everything that's happened in these two paragraphs in a good 300 words here, this might actually be 300 words, maybe only 200, but 200 words here have gone by and he has only been kicked and he is only collapsing into an egg. The pathetic screeches of the shaman groveling in dejected misery upon the hand-honed granite-laid pavement, worn smooth by countless hours of arduous sweat and toil, a welter of ichor oozing through his clenched hands, attracted the perturbed attention of his comrades from their fetid elations. The actions of this this rebellious wench bespoke the credence of an unheard of, of an unheard of sacrilege. Never before, in a lost maze of untold eons, had a chosen one dared to demonstrate such blasphemy in the face of the cult's idolic deity. Um, in the middle of all of this, I love that in the middle of this sentence, the pathetic screeches of the shaman grovel. This guy's screaming. He's on the pavement. And then the author goes... The pavement, which was worn smooth by countless hours of arduous sweat and toil. A welter of ichor e oozing through his clenched hands. We go, like, right in the middle. Guy collapsing in agony. To, oh, by the way, what workmanship on this, uh, on this floor here. Isn't it marvelous? And his agony. Like, just no transition. That's beautiful. The artlessness in the middle of that sentence is just absolutely stunning. It becomes art of its own. The actions of this rebellious wench bespoke the credence of an unheard of sacrilege. I don't know what we're communicating here. Um, I guess she did something that would be unholy. I don't think that that's what they'll be thinking. Like the monks or whatever, the shamans all watching this aren't going to go like, sacrilege, she kicked the, she kicked the priest. That is so uncouth. Like they're going to be like, like she just kicked the priest. Get her. Right? It's going to be like a lot more like, kill the wench in the language of this thing. This could be like a five page story. Yep. Oh, uh, no, actually, I'm going to say no. I, I, I retract that. Yep. I don't think it could be a five page story. I don't think it's a story. <laughs> but indeed, if it was rewritten, I think this could be rewritten in about two pages. Um, this could be a two page prologue. Um, yeah, shapes. We got so many ages. Uh, shapes. Um, the the shapes are the um, the spelling errors. Yeah, the spelling errors are stunning. The girl cowered in unreasoning terror. What do you mean unreasoning terror? It seems pretty reasonable. She was just attacked by a priest, and like stuff started coming out of her eyeballs. Of course, she's gonna cower in terror. What do you mean unreasoning? This is perfectly reasonable terror. Helpless in the face of the emblazoned acolyte's rage, her orchid-tussled face smothered betwixt her bulging bosom as she shut her curled lashed tightly, as she shut her curled lashed tightly, hoping to open them and find herself awakening from a morbid nightmare. So we're importing a belief onto her right here, tightly, hoping them, hoping to open them and find herself awakening from a morbid nightmare. So we're assuming what she hopes I don't think the scene was from her perspective, right? The scene was supposed to be from Grigner's perspective, but maybe we have like a... Oh, maybe not. Okay, so we just had a random perspective shift. I guess that's my fault for not noticing that. Um, but we weren't given any other perspectives from Grigner's before. So this is... Yeah, it's weird to suddenly get this girl's perspective. Who the hell is she? We don't know. We don't know her name. And I don't know if this is supposed to be from like her perspective. It's, it seems like her, not the priest. But okay, so her hope, I guess, is fine in there. 
We still want to cut it because we don't want internal dialogue like that, but whatever. Yet the hand of destiny decreed her no such mercy. The antagonized pack of leering shaman converging tensely upon her prostrate form were entangled all too lividly in the grim web of reality. This is such like meta writing right here, yet somehow unaware. Shuddering from the, claim, the clammy touch of the shaman as they grappled with her supple form. Okay, nope, I've got to stop on this one. This is, this is ridiculous. Like, I mean, pause on this one. She, we're in the middle of a grope scene, right? Like, all these people are doing, like, really gross, weird, disgusting things and, like, reaching at this, like, girl, this helpless girl. This is supposed to be a scene where we're all sitting here, like, sympathizing with the girl. Oh, my God, this is so horrible. Like, what's happening? And we're told that her form is supple in the middle of this narrative explanation of the action. Shuddering from the clammy touch of the shaman, right? This is supposed to be, like, a scary thing. Oh, no, what's this girl going to do? As they grappled with her supple form. give this 10 years and it'll be a postmodern masterpiece. Oh my goodness. I think like, I think some people already think it is. Some people would already be inclined to think so. Oh, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the follow, Andre, Andre Perry. Um, yeah, this is, this is scary. This is scary to read because of how unaware it is in the way that it's framing things. If we are framing her as having a supple form and she's the victim, we're almost like implicitly encouraging this action. <laughs> Hands wrenching at her slender arms and legs in all directions, right? We're making this seem desirable. Her bare body being molested in the midst of a labyrinth of orange smudges, purpled satin, and mangled skulls shadowed in an eerie crimson glow. Her confused head reeled then in cloud, then clouded in a mist of enshrouding ebony as she lapsed beneath the protective sheet of unconsciousness to a land peach and resign. Don't know what that was supposed to say. To a land peach. She found herself in a land peach. Um, it's probably like James and the Giant Peach, right? That's that's a land peach. It's just a giant peach. Um, okay, whatever that is. Ignoring that. Ignoring the weirdness that we got at the end here of her protective sheet of unconsciousness. It does not seem that protective. In fact, it seems very detrimental to being conscious in the middle of all of these priests groping you. But whatever. Okay, we'll say that that's protective if that's how we want to frame this. We're like, this is, this is disturbing to frame in the middle of this like rape scene, basically, even if they're not going to actually like rape her, this is basically a rape scene. Um, in the middle of this non-consent scene, we just are describing her as supple with her slender arms and legs going in all directions, her bare body. That is gross. This is, this is very gross. Like, uh. um, at that point. That is the point that, as an editor, when you read something like this, you know that there is something very, very wrong with the way that the the author is thinking about their own scenes. <laughs> because unless you're writing erotica, actually writing it for actual people who want to read erotica, um, you're not going to be describing a rape scene like it's a good thing. This is describing a rape scene like it's sexy. <laughs> it's not. So, like, just very problematic. You want to sit down, you want to have a conversation with the author about, like, why did we frame it in this way? And why did you seem to think about it in this way? Um, because what's being communicated is this, and, uh, like, it's a good thing. And usually, readers do not want to read rape like it was supposed to be a good thing. Um, because it isn't. So... What intention do you have behind this scene? You're probably going to get an answer like, oh, the intention was to have a bad rape scene. And then you go, okay, the way that we write a bad rape scene is by making it bad, by using bad words. Like we say, we focus on the actions as opposed to focusing on her body. By framing it and focusing on her body, we are focusing on the, you know, like the, um, the, like, porny aspect of it. We're focusing on the part that that is um, quote unquote desirable to to the audience that reads a rape scene like that and finds it enjoyable, um, as opposed to focusing on the uh, like 
how disgusting these these people are who are groping her, who are the violence with which they're doing it. How um, you know we can we can focus on the darkness, we can focus on like of the room and that kind of stuff. We can focus on how much they um, like pain. Those sorts of things are usually fine to focus on. Of course, I also would say usually you just want to pan the camera away for a scene like this um, because probably don't want to just be like throwing in gratuitous rape scenes in the middle of most stories, especially like just a random fantasy story like this or a sci-fi story like this. But whatever, every scene has its purpose. If you had a scene like that that did have a purpose, try to focus on the bad aspects of it. Um, and that'll be a little bit less um, of an egregious error. Goodness. Take hold of this rope, said the first soldier, and climb out from your pit, slut. Your presence is requested in another far deeper hellhole. Okay, this is a Grigner scene again, and the soldiers are definitely calling Grigner slut. And I don't get it. I don't get it. I imagine maybe the author was trying to give us, like, use a word in a new way. Or maybe, maybe, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look up real quick, and we'll just see slut etymology. Let's take a look. When did it come around? Was it used in the 1970s? It was definitely used in the 1970s. 1970s-ish, be right around here. Definitely used in the 1970s. This is a weird word for him to be using. Okay. Answered that clearly. This is weird. Um, for some reason, they keep calling Grigner a slut. So maybe we like justify this by saying, like, oh, it's the future. And so in the future, slut means something different. I would tell the author this is confusing and weird. Um, you want to change this to a word that your audience is not going to immediately be, um, you know, associating with like, quote unquote, sultry women or something like that. And instead, uh, use a word that is made up. Use a made up word or use like a word like you could use like barb, short for barbarian, right? If they're calling him a barbarian or savage, make some sort of slang out of that. This is weird, though. Calling him a slut. This whole thing now reads like some sort of weird humiliation fantasy. Grigner slipped his right hand to his thigh, concealing a small, opaque object beneath the folds of the G-string wrapped around his waist. Maybe this is just some weird humiliation fantasy. <laughs> I say that tongue-in-cheek, and then two sentences late, one sentence later, we get G-string wrapped around his waist. Okay, okay, never mind. Nope, this is this is just a humiliation, like fan service, fiction, fantasy, whatever. This is this is erotica. I, I'm convinced now. Brian Wells swelled in Grigner's cold, jade squinting eyes, which, grown accustomed to the gloom of the Stygian pools of ebony engulfing him, were bedazzled and blinded by flickering, flickering radiance cast forth by the second soldier's resin torch. Tightly gripped in the second soldier's right hand, opposite the intermittent torch, was a large double-edged axe, a long leather wound wound oaken handled tr oh my goodness so many of these like compound adjective phrases a long leather wound oaken handled transfixing the center of the weapon's iron head adorning the torsos of both the sentries were thin yet sturdy hauberks the breast the breastplates of which were woven of tightly hemmed twines of reinforced silver braiding cupping the soldiers feet were thick leather sandals wound about their shins to two inches below their knees Wrapped about their waists were wide satin girdles with slender bladed poniards dangling loosely from them, the hilts of which featured scarlet encrusted gems. Resting upon... Oh, so many things are resting on, cupping, grapped in, adorning. And then we've got spiraling right after this. There's a lot of these like compound like... Like their armor was resting atop their shoulders, which was adorned with this. These like compound descriptions many layers of description an actual reader could hold on to like one of these i don't i can't picture any of their armor right now because i'm so distracted by each following description if you're going to describe something you want really just like one just pick one thing to describe in an entire scene like per every like maybe um five lines of dialogue you can add one more thing <laughs> But really, most of the book should just be action and dialogue. There is no need to describe a bunch of things because that is not what readers open a book for. Nobody cares what Harry Potter's color 
of the, his hair is. Resting upon the manes of their heads and reaching midway to their brows were smooth copper morions. Spiraling the lower portion of the helmet were short, upcurved silver spikes, while a golden hump spired from the top of each bassinet. Beneath their chins, wound around their necks, and draping their clad shoulders, dangled regal purple satin cloaks, which flowed midway to the soldiers' feet. Hand over hand, feet braced against the dank walls of the enclosure, Huge Grigner ascended from the moldering depths of the forlorn abyss, his swelled limbs stiff due to the boredom of a timeless inactivity, compounded by the musty atmosphere and jagged granite protuberant against his body, craved for action. The opportunity now presenting itself served the purpose of oiling his rusty joints and honing his dulled senses. He braced himself, facing the second soldier. The sentry's stature was wildly exaggerated in the glare of the flickering crescent cuppocks in his right fist. His eyes were wide open in a slight slanted owlish glaze, enhanced in their sinister intensity by the hawk-bill curve of his nose and pale yellow peak of his cheeks. "'Place your hands behind your back,' said the second soldier as he raised his axe over his right shoulder blade and cast it a wavering glance." We must bind your wrists to parry any attempts at escape. Be sure to make the knot a stout one, Broig. We wouldn't want our guests to take leave of our guidance. So everyone in this in this whole novella, I forgot what it was called for a moment. Everyone in it speaks with this absolute, like drama to everything they say. Place your hands behind your back. We must bind your wrists to parry any attempts at escape. We don't want you to, like, like you would say in a normal, like, everyday speech. And there's a tendency among fantasy and sci-fi writers, especially, to want to impute or um, incorporate more formal writing. To want to have them speak. These are the high nobles, and of course they're going to speak in a very posh way. These are the guards. They're going to speak proper because they're they're guards and they're rigid military types or whatever. They speak with good grammar. Um, and then I guess for some reason also our barbarians speak normal. 90% of the time in a novel, that's going to be the best possible approach. Because what you can do is you can pepper in fancier, more posh ways of speaking among particular characters, very, very specific ones, used very, very sparingly, and you get a much more drastic effect. If everybody in your novel speaks like an everyday person, they use contractions. Um, instead of, we must bind your wrists to parry any attempts at escape, they say something like, bind his wrists. Or bind his hands. They wouldn't even refer to the wrist, probably. Just, or just bind him. Bind him. We don't want him to run away. You say something normal, and everything... Like, the reader doesn't sit here thinking like, Psh, these gods wouldn't speak normally. What ridiculous person thinks a god is going to speak like that? In fact, most guards probably wouldn't speak formally. Most guards are probably going to speak like commoners, right? They're going to speak because most of the guards probably came from commoner-ish type classes, unless they're knights or they're like the royal guards. In this case, they might be. He just came from the throne room not that long ago. Or maybe it was that long ago because time is irrelevant at this point. He can't even process it. But the point being that you 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 want regular dialogue you want regular everyday people talking because the reader is going to feel more engaged by it that's what they're used to that just makes sense unless you're going for an extremely alien effect for your entire novel as in like you want when your reader picks up that novel and they see the first lines of dialogue you want them to feel like i could never make it in this world because i don't speak elizabethan that's the effect that comes off. If they have to sit here processing, like, what the words of every one of the characters are saying, then they get the sense that, like, oh, this world is impenetrable. He's planning to... Did G-string mean something different? He's planning to restring the guitar later. Yeah, exactly. Great. But he's that kind of guy. Let's learn how to play Stairway to Heaven. Meanwhile, 
princess character that speaks like a child and swears like a sailor. Exactly. That's exactly what we would want. Like, I think, um, keep using this example. George R. R. Martin's characters do not speak like posh grand, like, wizards or, oh, grand wizard means something different. Sorry. Grand, um, I don't know, nobles or whatever. They, they don't speak like Elizabethan queens. Um, they speak much, much more regularly. Um, I mean, they throw around words that, like, most modern-day people would cringe from saying. Broig grasped Grigner's left wrist and reached for the barbarian's right wrist. Ooh, they're both grasping at wrists here. What engaging action. Grigner wrenched his right arm free and swiveled to face Broig. Reach beneath his loincloth with his right hand. The sentry grappled at his girdle for the sheath dagger, but recoiled short of his intentions as Grigner's right arm swept to his gorge. I don't know how gorge is being used here. The action is very vague here, except for the odd specificity that we have over which is their right and left hands, like what their right and left hands are doing. We have extreme specificity about which hands they're using. Um, the effect that it gives us is one that it matters um, when it definitely doesn't. It never matters which hand they're using. The soldier went limp. Oh, unless your character only has one hand. In that case, it definitely matters. Um, and you still don't need to say it. The soldier went limp, his bobbing eyes rolling beneath fluttering eyelids. Bobbing means rolling. We don't need this. One of these words is redundant. A deep welt across his spouting gullet. Without lingering to observe the results of his efforts, Grigner dropped to his knees. The second soldier's axe cleft over Grigner's head in a blaze of silvered ferocity, severing several scarlet locks from his scalp. Coming to rest in his fellow's stomach, the iron head crashed through mail and flesh with splintering force spilling a pool of crimsoned entrails over the granite paving. He really loves that letter S. Before the sentry could wrench his axe free from his comrade's carcass. Oh, now he loves the letter C. Okay, he's just, he's just switching around all the alliteration. He found Grigner's massive hands clasped around his throat, choking the life. We spelled choking right this time, thank goodness. Choking the life from his clamped lungs with a zealous grunt. The accordion flexed. We still were not told what an accordion is. So, like, this word got thrown around now twice, in the middle of the action, and there has been no additional context given to us about what this should mean. The accordion flexed his tightly corded biceps, forcing the grim-faced soldier to one knee. The sentry plunged his right fist into Grigner's face, digging his grimy nails into the barbarian's flesh, ejaculating... <laughs> I promised myself I would not laugh if that word came up. And I failed already in my promise. Okay. Ejaculating a curse through rasping teeth, Grigner surged the bulk of his weight for forward, bowling the besieged soldier upon his back. The sentry's arms collapsed to his thigh, shuddering convulsively. <laughs> in case you don't know what shuddering is, I've turned convulsing into an into an adverb so that I can better convey to you how violently this man is shuddering. Collapsed to his thigh, shuddering convulsively, his bulging eyes staring blindly from a bloated, cherry red face. I think those two sentence, those two words, shuddering convulsively, should be used as the prime example of overwriting. That is the cleanest, most perfect example of overwriting I've ever seen in my life. He shuddered convulsively. Not he, because it could have been he convulsed shudderingly. But no, that would not have conveyed the image quite as tightly and violently. Instead, it was that he shuddered convulsively. That's amazing. To come up with that word, convulsively, I don't think that's a, like, I don't think that's a word. I'm pretty sure. Rising to his feet, Grigner shook the blood. 
the blood from his eyes ruffling his surly red mane as a brush fire swang to the nighttime breeze. Stooping over the sp sprawled corpse of the first soldier, Grigner retrieved a small white object from a pool of congealing gore, snorting a gusty billow of mirth. He once more concealed the tiny object beneath his loincloth, the tediously honed pelvis bone of the broken rodent. Oh, he did grab a bone of the rodent. Excellent. I am happy. I feel just a little bit validated because that is what I thought he grabbed from the rodent, but I was so prepared for it to be some random BS like, no, it was a lockpick. It was a blade. It was a razor blade. Something ridiculous. It was a bone. That makes sense. We were able to predict that. This is the first example of the writing actually connecting. Returning his attention toward the second soldier, Grigner turned to the task of attiring his limbs. Attiring his limbs? Like dressing them? With what? To move about freely through the dim recesses of the castle would require the grotesque garb of its soldiery. Oh no, he did actually dress himself. Okay, that was stupid. Um, the grotesque garb of its soldiery. Utilizing the silence and stealth acquired... So I really hate the word utilizing. I think everybody who writes generally has a very strong feeling about this word. The only reason that I dislike it is because I think it's very usually misused. To utilize something is to use something in a way that it is not intended to be used. That's usually what we mean by utilize. So if I utilize a pen to stab someone, pens are usually for writing. They are not used for stabbing someone. And so I have successfully utilized the pen, but I did not use the... Well, I mean, I could have used the pen to stab him. That's also fine. But I wouldn't utilize a pen to write. I would use a pen to write. Maybe it's a stabby pen. Such connection, such wow, indeed. Yeah, all of that. Um, I used to do that with the left hand, right hand, I learned. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, being specific about this because the thing is when we're when we're writing it, we have this very specific image of like how things are unfolding. And we want the choreography to be clear because we don't want the action to be painted in such a way that it ends up not making sense. And then later, either we have to rewrite it and we're not sure how the action actually works because like now we're confused or it's like it's sufficiently unclear to the reader and they're just left with this like blobbery image of like body parts going everywhere. Is this a fight scene or is this like a romantic scene or something? I don't know. I can't tell how people are interacting with each other. Their bodies are just ragdolls. Um, in this case, what? yeah, both, both is somehow happening here. We are given extremely specific descriptions of every individual body part as, as it is moving through the scene. We are also given such weird verbs and weird actions that it is still the bodies of ragdolls just flailing about. Bodies of ragdolls in loincloths. I'm currently editing and I had one instance the hand thing as well. <laughs> it's, it, you know, one or two of them isn't so bad. This guy like did it like six times in one paragraph. So, you know, sometimes unless like the only times that I can think that it would be important to mention which hand, like left or right, would be if you're saying something about like they're missing fingers. That might be important which hand they're missing the fingers on. Um, or maybe you've got something like a wedding ring, right? A wedding ring or a ring, you know, something culturally significant, some piece of jewelry or something that it means different things if it's on the right or the left, etc. So those would be important things. In action, though, <laughs> it's generally not that important. <laughs> we, we usually in action just want to know like, oh, he hit her. And then the reader doesn't, doesn't go like, which hand did he hit her with? Hmm, that doesn't make sense because his left hand was occupied. He had his left hand in his pocket. How did he hit her with his right hand? Hmm, this is ridiculous. I don't believe a second of this. If you have readers like that, um, you need to, like, fire them. Because J.K. Rowling never got that crap. And she had magic in her story, which completely defies explanation entirely. So... Magic, by the way, that was entirely manipulable by speaking Latin, of, like... So many complaints can be leveled. Okay. So he's got the bone. Utilizing self and silence. Uh, oh, no, we haven't read that one. Okay. Utilizing. Uh, so he's got, the, he's, he's got the bone. We still don't know what he's going to do with the bone yet. He snorted a gusty billow of mirth. Um, snorting is inhaling, right? So he snorted 
a billow, which usually billows are exhaled, unless he snorted like out and mirth just exited his nose and billowed in the air. Uh, this, this is very much like the rest of this. Utilizing the silence and stealth, again, utilizing, nope. And you also can't util like, you'd utilize an object. You don't utilize stealth and silence. You become stealth. You become silence. Okay. Utilizing the stealth and silence acquired in the untamed climbs of his childhood, Grigner slinked through the twisting corridors and winding stairways, lighting his way with the confiscated torch of his dispatched guardian. Knowing where his steps were leading to, Grigner meandered aimlessly in search of an exit from the chateau's dim confines. He knew where his steps were leading to and meandered aimlessly in search of an exit. Snort should be inhaled. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I thought as well. Um I don't he knows where he's going and yet he's meandering aimlessly. As one does. What a barbarian this guy is. The wild blood coursing through his veins, in case you forgot that he's wild. Yearned for the undefiled freedom of the livid wilderness lands. The why are they angry? The livid wilderness lands. The wilderness lands are all angry. This is just clearly incorrect word use. Um, and this is why I would have, after reading the first like chapter, if it can be called a chapter, uh, I would have sent it back to the author and I would have said seven words, seven to ten words per sentence. That's all you get. Cut out anything unnecessary. Also, you're barred from using adjectives. I would have barred them from using adjectives. No more adjectives for you. You do not understand the purpose of adjectives. Coming upon a fork in the passage, he trekked. Having to like live correct these words in my head. Coming upon a fork in the passage, he trekked. Voices accompanied by clinking footfalls discerned to his sensitive ears from the left corridor. This is twice now we've seen the word discerned used completely incorrectly. Wishing to avoid discerning is when you are like, I'm going to discern between the blue and red colors that are intermixing in this tapestry. Like, I'm going to discern between them. I'm going to differentiate between these these many things that are occurring. Um, and he's discerning. He's just discerning footfalls. He's just discerned to his sensitive ears. Like, against what? Discerned from what? The silence? Or voices accompanied? Like, what's... whatever. Wishing to avoid contact, Grigner veered to the right passageway. If aquested as to the purpose of his presence... His barbarous accent would reveal his identity, being that his attire was not that of the castle's mercenary troops. He, what did he dress in the outfit for? If his attire is not that of the castle's mercenary troops, his barbarous accent would reveal his identity. That makes sense. This needs some more explanation, I guess. It's it's sometimes like when I'm... So there's this sense that I get sometimes when I'm editing an academic work. I, I edit a lot of academic papers. That's like primarily where most of my editing work is. Um, because my like specialty is in like recrafting words to better communicate ideas. I come from philosophy. That's like a much, much needed skill. Um, and that's what I've been like trained in doing the, when you are reading like an academic paper and they give you like a definition of a word, they use some sort of word like, um, I don't know. I was reading a paper recently in psychology and they, they made up their own term. They do this a lot in academic papers. They make a term up for a specific phenomenon. So they say something like a phenomenal anguish, right? Maybe that's like a term for some kind of special feeling of anguish that you feel in like a spiritual self or something. Um, and they, they give you this term and then they try to define it. And it's very hard to define terms when you're in psychology or philosophy. Like you've got all these like really uh, fluffy terms these really philosophical terms, terms for high concepts that are really hard to narrow down into very specific words so that people can understand what you're talking about in an academic sense. And often, 
I will get a paper that needs to be edited onto my desk and I read it and I feel really dumb when I don't understand things. Now that happened to me the first like several times that I was editing papers. Mostly that feeling's gone now, but um, it does happen occasionally, especially when I get like like physicists or something. I get some sort of paper that deals with like I've had papers that deal with quantum physics um, and I read them. And as a developmental editor, like, I don't know what I'm developing for. Like, what ideas can I help you correct? Because I don't understand these equations. So you can feel really dumb when you're editing that because you're like, obviously, this guy's a genius. So if he describes some idea and I don't have an idea of what it is, would a physicist have an idea of what this is? And that's what's really important. In fantasy, of course, or in science fiction, um, a general audience should usually have an idea. Um, which is why when I'm reading academic papers, I can often feel really, really dumb as an editor and uh, less qualified for my job than I might otherwise feel like if I was like a fantasy editor or something. Where when I read something like this and I don't understand what's going on, my first assumption is not, wow, I must be a moron. Um, these words don't make sense. In grim silence, Grigner treaded down the dingily lit corridor a stalking panther creeping warily along on padded feet. After an interminable period of wandering through the dull corridors, no gaps to break the monotony of the cold, gray walls, Grigner espied a small, winding stairway. Descending the flight of arced granite slabs to their posterior, Grigner was confronted by a short hallway leading to a tall, arched wooden doorway. I understand that while reading through your own writing, you might look over things and stuff, but like this, mm -hmm. yeah, because they're wild, like Rigner, indeed, yeah, yeah, it's, um, I mean, this wasn't even given a proofread, clearly, hallway, hallway, dingily, I applaud the effort to make up a word here, the dingily lit corridor, it's kind of a gross sounding word, though. Halting before the teeming portal portal. <laughs> it's, it's a portal portal. <laughs> okay, the, 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 we've had some raw repetition happen a couple of times. I let it slide on the word the. I didn't let it slide on um, whatever had happened right after that. It was like uh, blood or something like that. But oh my goodness, it's happening so many times here. We had sp sprawled. <laughs> and now we have the, the portal portal. It's the portal of all portals, people. That's what it is. Grigner, halting before the teeming portal portal, Grigner rests, restus, his shaggy head sideways. Oh, that was a typo. This one's a typo. Okay, I'll forgive the typewriter typo here. Restus instead of rested. He missed the D. Okay, Grigner rested his shaggy head sideways against the barrier. Detecting no sounds from within, he grasped the looped metal handle of the door, his arms surging with a tremendous effort of bulging muscles, yet the door would not budge. Retrieving his axe from where he sheathed it behind, beneath his girdle, he hefted it in his mighty hands with an apesid grunt. With an apesid... I don't know what this word is. A... With an apesid grunt, I... whatever. And wedging one of its blackened edges into the crack between the portal and its iron-rimmed sill. Bracing his sandaled right foot against the roughly hewn wall, teeth tightly clenched, Grigner apple-levered the oaken haft, employing it as a lever whereby to pry open the barrier. Apple-levered? Apple-levered, okay. That one's getting a look up. Apple levered. Nope. Nope. Not a word. When only this story <laughs> returns. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's an Eye of Argon Twitter. What is this? Picture and text taken from it. <laughs> That's funny. The leather wound hilt bending to its utmost limits of endurance, the massive portal swung open with a grating of snapped latch and rusty iron hinges. Okay, the portal swung open. Have we been talking about doors this whole time? Have we been calling doors portals? Because this is a science fiction work. If we are talking about portals, we should be talking about portals. 
I think we've only been talking about doors because they open with levers and they swing open with grating of a snapped latch and rusty iron hinges. This portal has hinges. We are either looking at some sort of sci-fi universe with the sort of like rusty feel of Star Wars, the sort of grunge feel, grunge space punk, which has not been communicated as this kind of genre. Or we are talking about doors and we've been calling regular normal doors portals. Grunge punk, yep. No, we've been calling them portal portal. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, don't worry. The lost the lost ending is in this version. I've I've got the the version with the um yeah, we've got eye orbs, portal portals. Glancing about the dust swirled room in the gloomily dancing glare of his flickering crescent, Grigner eyed evidences of the enclosure being nothing more than a forgotten storeroom. Miscellaneous articles required for the maintenance of a castle were piled in disorganized heaps at infrequent intervals toward the wall opposite the barbarian's piercing stare. Utilizing long, bounding strides, Grigner paced his way over to the mounds of supplies to discover if any articles of value were contained within their midst. Detecting a faint clinking sound, Grigner sprawled to his left side with the speed of a striking cobra. Landing harshly upon his back, torch and axe loudly clattering to the floor in a morass of sparks and flame. I don't know what's going on in this action scene here. He sprawled to his left side. He can't sprawl in a direction um, with the speed of a striking cobra. So we're given the sense that it's an intentional action, right? He did it very, very quickly. He sprawled suddenly like a cobra, striking. And his torch and his axe loudly clattered to the floor. An elm-woven board le leaped from collapsed flooring, clashing against the jagged flooring, and spewing a shower of orange and yellow sparks over Grigner's startled face. Rising uneasily to his feet, the half-stunned accordion glared down the gruesome arm of death he had unwittingly sprung. Rifk! <laughs> if not for his keen auditory organs and lightning, lighting steeled reflexes. So it's like... His reflexes are like steel, but well-lit steel. It's steel that you can see all of the nice shine on. A lot of light is coming off of the steel. If not for his keen auditory organs, ears, I think those are called ears, could be wrong. If not for his keen auditory organs and lighting steeled reflexes, Grigner would have been groping through the shadowed hell pits of the Grim Reaper. He had unknowingly stumbled upon an ancient long-forgotten booby trap, a mistake which would have stunted the perusal of longevity of one less agile. A mechanism similar in type to that of a miniature catapult was concealed beneath two collapsible sections of granite flooring. The arm of the device was four feet long, boasting razor-like cleats at regular intervals along its face with which it was to skewer the luckless body of its would-be victim. Grigner had stepped upon a concealed catch, which relaced a small metal latch beneath the two granite sections, causing them to fall inward and thereby loose the spiked arm of death they precariously held in. Partially out of curiosity and partially out of an inordinate fear of becoming a, pinch cu a pin cushion for a possible second trap, Grigner plunged his torch into the exposed gap in the floor. The floor of a second chamber stood out seven feet below the glare. Tossing his torch through the aperture, Grigner grasped the side of an adjoining tile, dropping down. Um, we had a lot of description here about this torture weapon. And he called it a booby trap, which, generally speaking, booby trap is what we call them. Um, most people, unless they're like Indiana Jones, are not looking at those things going like, Oh my god, it's a booby trap. They're going, oh my god, it's going to kill me, right? Um, booby trap is kind of a humorous term. It's just weird. This tone is very, very odd. The tone of the story has been odd since its beginning, of course. It has not ceased to be odd. Um, and we are unsurprised at this section. But, nevertheless, we did spend a long time describing a booby trap, which was supposed to be activated very, very quickly. He stepped on it, and bam, it released it. Whew. He's attacked. 
Uh, and then he goes on to like, I guess, stare at it for like two minutes straight while he talks about the spikes. Remember that every time that you're describing something in a novel, in fiction, in writing, every time you're describing it, it's usually because you have a character you're describing it from the perspective of who is focusing on it. <laughs> and if they're focusing on it long enough to tell you how many spikes there are or how long it is, it's four feet long. <laughs> um, they're probably not moving. Not a whole lot of action happening. Not a whole lot of reaction happening. So he's probably going to get eaten by the booby trap. Allow. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I'm so sorry for that auto mod. That auto mod is just like being... Um... He just wanted an excuse to say booby. Um... Yeah, that auto mod's annoying. I will work on him later. Them. Um... Glancing about the room, Grigner discovered that he had descended into the palace's mausoleum. I am surprised we spelled this one correctly, honestly. Given how many words we have spelled wrong in this story so far, I am surprised we didn't see M-O-S-S-I-L-I-U-M. -S -S mausoleum. Rectangular stone crypts... <laughs> More rectangles. I'm so happy. More rectangles. Okay. Rectangular stone crypts cluttered the floor at evenly placed intervals. The tops of the enclosures were plated with thick layers of virgin gold, while the sides were plated with white ivory, at one time sparkling but now grown dingy through the passage of the rays of all-encompassing mother time. All-encompassing. Allen. <laughs> all-encompassing. All-encompassing mother time. Mother time had a son named Allen, that's why she is mother time. And her time... You can tell the direction of it based off of where Alan is. Alan compassing Mother Time. Featured at the head of each sarcophagus in tarnished silver was an... Ex what the... I don't even know what this word is. Ex expugnacively carved likeness of its rotting inhabitant. Expugnacively 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 having a wide range or extent comprehensive extensive expansive oh no that's not a word <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> it's like i was going crazy for a moment nope not a word <laughs> i'm sane still i don't know what this word is supposed to be expensively maybe expugnacively carved the likeness of its rotting inhabitant a dingy atmosphere pervaded the <clears throat> voice just suddenly disappeared okay a dingy atmosphere pervaded the air of the chamber which sealed in the enclosure for an unknown period had grown thick and stale intermingling with the curdled currents was the repugnant stench of slowly moldering flesh creeping ever slowly but surely through the cracks in numerous vaults in the numerous vaults due to the embalming of the bodies their flesh decayed at a much slower rate than is normal. Yet the nauseous odor, <laughs> odor, was nonetheless repellent. I usually won't, if I'm like editing something and I see a lot of misspellings, I usually don't even like, first of all, I tell them like, you need to turn your spell check on, obviously. But I usually don't like focus on it a whole lot because like, it's just, it's, it's unnecessary. Like a word speller thing, program word can get it. Um, the like the proofreader honestly usually it's also the proofreader's job so i'm just like yeah just throw it onto the line out of the proofreader whatever they can they can handle those but like it is so egregious in this and what's what's particularly egregious about this one is that he will spell the word correctly two paragraphs earlier and then he will spell the word incorrectly so it's not that he didn't know how to spell the word it's that he was too lazy to spell it correctly both times <laughs> or correct it Towering over Grigner's head was the trap he released, the mechanism of the miniaturized catapult. Catapult. Was cluttered with mildew and cobwebs. Notwithstanding these relics of antiquity, its efficiency remained unimpinged. 
To the right of the trap wound a short stairway through a recess in the ceiling, a concealed entrance leading to the mausoleum for which the catapult had obviously been erected as a silent, relentless guardian. Climbing up the side of the device. I thought it was like four feet long. How is he climbing up it? When we when we describe something as only four feet long, or like the hand is four feet long, or whatever it is, like you, you're, you're describing something small, four feet long, like like the size of a small child, and then we are imagining, like usually, if you want to say something's big, you just say it's big. You you say the whole thing is big. You don't describe one small part of it and say that part's small. If that's what happened here, if I'm remembering a part that he described which was small, but the rest of it was actually big. Just describe the big thing. Describe the thing that you want the reader to associate with this object. And in this case, clearly, it's big enough for him to climb. We want big. Climbing up the side of the device, Grigner set to the task of resetting its mechanism. In the event that a search was organized, it would prove well to leave no evidence of his presence open to wandering eyes. Besides, it might even serve to dwindle the size of an opposing force. This is such a weird way to describe his plan. Descending from his perch, Grigner was startled by a faintly muffled scream of horrified desperation. Was startled. He was startled. Again, this is going to be some passive voice here. What we should do is we should just say the thing that startles him. This thing startled him. Bam. And then we can keep the reader engaged. We want active verbs, active phrasing. But of course, we know all of this. This is no secret to anyone. Somehow we've made it this far. I am, I am surprised, to be honest. As a cold danced along the length of his spinal cord. Oh, that's the complete sentence. His hair prickled yawkishly, yawkishly, in the disorganized clumps along his scalp. As a cold danced along the length of his spinal cord. It's fine to have a not complete sentence in a, um, in like fantasy and fiction. Like, you can have one word sentences. But like... This is weird. I, I, I don't know what like how to say what the rule is for doing it. Um, it should flow, I guess. The period uh, should give us some sense of a pause and then some re-utterance of an idea. So we could get, she was, she was fearful to bring it to him, period. Afraid. She was fearful to bring it to him, afraid. Or we could even do, she was fearful to bring it to him, period, afraid of what he might say. Something like that. I mean, that's not the best example of it, but, you know, off the cuff here. Um, that would be more fine. I don't know what the, like, why that works and this doesn't. Maybe because this is a prepositional phrase. And prepositional phrases, oh, this isn't even, is it? Or it's just, it's just like a simile. It's weird, though. Um, so just don't put a simile in its own sentence like this. I guess that's the rule. <laughs> As a cold danced along the length of his spinal cord, no moral mortal, no moral slash mortal barrier, human or otherwise, was capable of arousing the numbing sensation of fear inside of Grigner's smoldering soul. It, I get, like, could he not decide if he wanted it to be a moral barrier or a mortal barrier? Is it a barrier that can die? Or is it a barrier of, like, morality? Is he not, people don't want to cross this barrier because then they become bad people. Either of them doesn't make sense in this sense. And why is his soul smoldering? It's a numbing sensation of fear inside of a smoldering soul. His soul was on fire. And it was like burning passionately, and now the ashes smoldering. His soul was in anguish or anger or whatever was going on with his soul there. Which, of course, we had no insight onto because there was no character set up for that. And then he's got a numbing sensation of fear, which would be antithetical to whatever a smoldering soul feels like. However, he was overwrought by the forces of the barbarian's instinctive fear of the supernatural his mighty thews had always served to adequately conquer any tangible foe, but the intangible was something distant and terrible. <laughs> yep, that's that's what intangible would have implied in that sentence, but thank goodness you spelled it out directly for us. Dim, horrifying tales passed by word of mouth over glimmering campfires and skins of wine had more than once served the purpose of chilling the marrowed core of his sturdy-limbed bones. 
Okay. Skins of wine had more than once served the purpose of chilling the marrowed core of his sturdy limbed bones. If you have a wine skin, wine skins are not cold. A wine skin is basically just a skin of wine. It's like, it's a, it's a what, what are those things called? What are those, like a pouch, a water pouch, right? It's a water pouch, but instead of water inside it is wine. Those are not cold because we don't put them in the fridge because they were had at a time when they didn't have fridges. So they wouldn't be cold. So how has this more than once served the purpose of chilling the marrowed core of his sturdy limbed bones? Even if you go, oh no, it's like him drinking the wine. When he drinks the wine, it chills the core of his marrowed bones. Most people liken drinking alcohol to feeling warmer. So this just doesn't make sense on any level. I don't even know where the author was like going, like where, what they were thinking, like here. This isn't, this isn't based off of any kind of human experience. Dim, horrifying tales passed by word of mouth. <laughs> it was a word of mouth campaign. It was a good guerrilla marketing campaign to get across those dim and horrifying tales. <laughs> Yet, the scream contained a strangely human quality. Have we been listening to a scream this whole time? Oh yeah, we have. A faintly muffled scream. I forgot because the description of it was so long. <laughs> the scream contained a strangely human quality, unlike that which Grigner imagined would come from the lungs of a demon or spirit, making Grigner take short, nervous strides advancing to the sarcophagus from which the sound was issuing. Again, we've switched from our, like, over overwrought language here to near academic descriptions this is the kind of description that i would expect from a scientist observing this grigner takes short nervous strides advancing to the sarcophagus from which the sound is issuing clenching his teeth in an attempt to steal his jangled nerves grigner slid the engraved slab from the vault with a sharp rasp of grinding stone Rasps are not sharp. Another long-drawn cry of terror, infested anguish, met the barbarian, scoring like the shrill piping of a demented banshee, piercing the inner fibers of his superstitious brain with primitive dread, dread, and awe. Really emphasizing the dread here. It's, it's not just dread. It's dread, dread. Um, shrill piping of a demented banshee. I actually thought that wasn't bad. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm pretty on board with this. This is cool. What sucks about this, what absolutely sucks about this work is that there are little pieces, little phrases that are really cool and then get absolutely drowned in everything else. So if you're editing it, it's very hard to find the diamond in the rough here. Because so much of it is rough. It's all rough. By the way, just to clarify, I know that um, I'm probably being mean. I'm probably being mean. And I would not say this to, like, if, if this was, like, not a published work. My absolute meanness as an editor only comes out for published works already. <laughs> um, odor is German and means or. <laughs> That's definitely it, yeah. Um, apparently this was copied from a manuscript covered with mistakes and words written on top of each other. So I think with the moral mortal, the person typing it up may have been unsure what it was meant to be. Oh, that may, that explains it. Yeah, that could be, that could be the case. Um, I think some of the mistakes were like corrected and, oh no, but it seems like all the mistakes were, uh, the mistakes were preserved. Anyway, that's weird. Stooping over to espy the wounds, the tomb's contents. Oh my goodness. I'm so used to him inserting random Freudian language. Okay. Stooping over to espy the tomb's contents, the glittering accordion's nostrils were singed by the scorching aroma of a moldering corpse. He's used that word twice now, moldering. Molder. Okay, to slowly decay or disintegrate. Again, doubting my like knowledge of the English language again, just because he keeps using nonsense words. 
long shut up and fermenting. So uh, the glittering accordion's nostrils were singed by the scorching aroma of a moldering corpse long shut up and fermenting, the same putrid scent which permeated the entire chamber, though multiplied to a much more concentrated dosage. Multiplied and dosage. Again, this is like that academic language coming out. So we're using this inconsistent tone um, where we're going back and forth between like gross <laughs> It's like a weird, gory, gross language that we use at times, to academic, to um, just like overwritten. There are so many competing tones. I wouldn't know how to, like if I was talking to the author, I'd have to know more about them and why they're doing this. But like my first bit of advice would be like sit down and cultivate one of these voices. You have like three competing voices going on in this work and we need to cultivate just one of them. So for like, you know, an hour a day, sit down and just write with one voice. Try to really focus on like only using an academic tone one day and then only using a fantasy tone. And it may be more like an editing game. It may be something that they require practice in editing their own stuff, but like we're gonna have to like get this focused. It's not focused at all, and that's like the biggest problem. The shriveled leathery packet of crumbling bones and dried flacking flesh offered no resistance, but remained in a fixed position of perpetual vigilance, watching over its dim abode from hollow gaping sockets. I got no images from that. Um, I got a lot of things falling apart. We got a lot of this like um, moldering stuff going on, seeing a lot of decay. Not seeing a lot of action though. Big problem. The tortured cries were not coming from... Cries. Eh. Were not coming from the tomb, but from a hidden depth. But from some hidden depth below. Pulling the reeking corpse from its resting place, Grigner tossed it to the floor in a broken, mangled heap. Upon one side of the crypt's bottom was attached a series of tiny hinges, while running parallel along the opposite side of a convex railing like a protuberance, laid so as to appear as a part of the interior surface of the sarcophagus. Raising the slab upon its bronze hinges, long removed from the gaze of human eyes, Grigner perceived a scene which caused his blood to smolder, not unlike bubbling molten lava. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. First of all, bubbling molten lava is not smoldering. We would not say that that is smoldering. But second of all, bubbling. Bubbling is the word that you used there. Molten lava would have been fine, maybe. Would have been finer. And we got bubbling molten lava. Directly below him, a whimpering female. <laughs> Here are the females again. <laughs> he has used females so many times. Directly below him, a whimpering female lay stretched upon a smooth-surfaced marble altar. A pack of gra greasy-faced shaman clustered around her in a tight circular formation. Crouched over the girl was a tall, pot-bellied priest, his face dominated by a disgusting, open-mouthed grimace of sadistic glee. Grimaces are not gleeful. Suspended from the acolyte's clenched right hand was a carven oval-faced mallet, which he waved menacingly over the girl's shadowed face, an incoherent gibberish flowing from his grinning, thick-lipped mouth. Is he st he's still alive then. Suspended from the priest's clenched right hand was a mallet, which he was waving over her face, an incoherent gibberish from his mouth. So he's speaking gibberish and he's waving a mallet over her face. I don't understand what's going on here. Um, okay. In the face of the amorphos, broad and... breeded? Broad... broad breeded... Bre I am worried about what that word is supposed to be. I'm very worried. I'm really hoping that that is not supposed to be broad-breasted female. What do you, is this? Is that broad-breasted female? That's not the only conclusion we can arrive at, right? There's there there could be broad breeded, breeded maybe breeded is a word. 
Breeded define. Nope, it's not a word. Created? Broad created? Nope. Okay. Uh, maybe we just go, surely it meant... <laughs> did a thing. Um, yeah, okay. Maybe maybe it's a broad beret. Love it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's, yeah, broad bereted female. She's wearing a very wide-brimmed beret. Um, Jesus. In the face of the amorphos... Is this amorphos? Amorphous? Whatever. In the face of the amorphos. We're going to say they're amorphos. In the face of the amorphos... Broad-breasted female stretched out. Oh, amorphous. It is amorphous. In the face of the amorphous, broad-breasted female stretched out alluringly before his gaping eyes, the universal whim of nature filling a plea of despair inside his white-hot soul, Grigner acted in the only manner he could perceive. Giving vent to a hoarse, throat-rending battle cry, Grigner plunged into the midst of the startled shaman, torch simmering in his left hand, and axe twirling in his right hand. A gaunt, skull-faced priest... What is a skull-faced priest? A gaunt, skull-faced priest, standing at the far side of the altar, clutched desperately at his throat, coughing furiously in an attempt to catch his breath. Lurching helplessly to and fro, the acolyte pitched headlong against the gleaming base of the massive jade idol. Writhing agonizedly against the hideous image, foam flecking his chalk-white lips. The priest struggled helplessly, the victim of an epileptic seizure. <laughs> so, um, I mean, props for realism here, right? I mean, I guess if we have a character here who suffers from epileptic seizures, um, it's appropriate that at some point in the novel they just have one. They have a seizure. Um, is that actually what's happening here? That was so random. I mean, I guess it would be random if we're going for realism, but we haven't been going for realism for any of this. So I don't know why suddenly one of the characters has an actual condition. Um, this is weird. This is... Uh, what would we do to... F is this... Okay, let's say that we were going for realism. Let's say that we talk to the author, and the author says, Oh, yeah, I really, like, I wanted in the middle of the scene, you know, these are different priests, and these priests, you know, they, they all have their own thing. And maybe, you know, in ancient cultures, this is a true fact, in ancient cultures, people who had epileptic seizures, you know, they, they were believed to be receiving divine providence. So, that's why he became a priest, okay? We're making an actual real connection. I don't believe that that is the research that was done behind this, but perhaps it was. So if we want this realism, what we would have to do is we would have to ditch all of the campy BS that we've been getting for the rest of this. We would have to write a decent story. If we want to go for realism, your story has to be believable before all of this. The realism has to seem real in the midst of real things. And so essentially we would have to talk to the author here. If that was something that was done for the sake of realism, we would have to tell them, your tone does not warrant realism by this point. And what we have to do is either switch the entire content of this story toward telling one that is somewhat realistic and believable, or we can embrace the campiness of so bad it's good, and we can ditch the realism. So this either has to be cut in order to preserve campiness or it has to be leaned into, in which case we have to cut literally everything else. <laughs> Startled by the barbarian's stunning appearance, the chronic fit of their fellow, and the fear that Grigner might be the avant-garde of a conquering force dedicated to the cause of destroying their degenerated cult, the Saman momentarily lost their composure. That's that's shaman plural, by the way, is Saman. It's not. Giving vent to heedless pandemonium, the priests fell easy prey to Grigner's sweeping arc of crimsoned death and maiming dis destruction. Destruction. 
The acolyte performing the sacrifice took a vicious blow to the, the stomach, hands clutching vitals and se severed spinal cord as he sprawled over the altar. The disorganized priests lurched and staggered with split skulls, dismembered limbs, and spewing entrails before the enraged accordion's relentless onslaught. Okay, so it's definitely, accordion does refer to Grigner. Um, I don't know why they're spewing entrails. Like, what did he do to them? He he had a, swim, a sweeping arc of crimson death and maiming destruction. So we just had Gr Grigner here, and he just, like, hits them. I guess. And he's got some kind of weapon, probably. Maybe he's got some kind of weapon here. This is a blade or, or some kind of stick. Ended up looking way cooler after Dobie tried to correct the lines. Um, and then he just does like a broad sweep. And somehow all of them are just spewing entrails. What? How does this person think that like entrails work? If you just, like, it turns out that humans are like balloons. If you just cut their stomach just a little bit, they just explode with entrails. That's the picture of action that we have here. So, um, let's see. White Hot sold uh, with all this moldering. Somebody had to be silly. <laughs> what does his tone warrant so far? His tone so far warrants probably no generosity, but... His tone, if, if I was actually trying to advise this to be turned into some kind of publishable work, I would be telling him, we need to make this campy. And in order to make this campy, we have to do this with a wink and a nod. Every little thing, um, like, and we don't actually have to do it with every little thing. But what we need is we need some self-awareness that like, yeah, it's bad, but it's bad and it's fun. Um, and like, campy works, um, like... The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Um, I think Conan the Barbarian fits into that, but um, some people, I don't know, maybe maybe people don't think that that's like campy and self-aware. Um, campy and self-aware, the perfect example of campy and self-aware. Any Monty Python, any um, any of like Mel, is it Mel Gibson? Wait, one of them's racist, one of them's funny. Uh Mel Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks is the funny one. Mel Gibson is the racist. Okay. Mel Mel Brooks. <laughs> yes. Um Mel Brooks, uh his campy films are also really funny. Um and the um uh The Princess Bride. The Princess Bride is a perfect example of like fantasy done in a fun campy way. So those are all like like they're bad. And it's known that they're bad. It's known that they were done with low budgets. It's known that, you know, the acting isn't the best. People people lean into the campiness. Now, of course, those are all films. Um, in The Princess Bride, the book, um, we get an equal sense of the, the campiness. They convey the campiness in the tone by um, leaning into how ridiculous, like, the plot pieces are. How much of this, like, um, maybe sometime we'll take an excerpt from that if I can find a public, like, a uh, uh, fair use copy. Um the they lean into things like the um deus ex machina the basically cheap storytelling ploys and they make fun of them in much more conscious ways by like sort of pointing out how ridiculous it is that this would appear here um when these characters give like really really long and specific backstories as to how they ended up in this fight and that's clearly not a thing that the reader actually gives a crap about when we have uh, Inigo Montoya and he appears suddenly before like the big guy and, and you get like some sort of speech about how long he's like I've wandered half the earth in order to find a sword a sword fighter as good as you and I I used to fight with the bulls in Spain and blah 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 like all of that stuff that's so campy there um the feud that exists between Inigo Montoya and the um the sword fighter and the, the sword fighter like later on um like solves his feud he ends the feud um I, it's been a while since i've read it but the the dialogue in there is intentionally bad it's obviously bad and it's intentionally bad and it's fun to read you know that it's going to be bad and so when you when you read it like the whole time they've been they've been you know aware of it. They've been leaning into it. They've been winking at you that it's going to happen. Uh, for this, that has not been happening. For this, it is not clear that it is intended to be bad, much in the same way that The Room, it is like the movie, it is not clear that it is intended to be a bad movie. Um, yeah. So how would we add an awareness of how bad this is? 
Oof. Usually when you're trying to make something like meta in that way, you're trying to make it more self-aware, you're trying to make it more campy, you're working with someone who is has already constructed that for you, who's already like laid the groundwork for the campy meta narrative. So you don't really have to edit too much to lean into it. In this case, yeah, I don't know. I honestly, um, I'd have to see what the author's rec- like what the author's ideas are. We'd have to try to talk about it and see what sorts of things we could land at because um, I've never written a story like that myself. So to try to like artificially craft that would be very, very difficult. Presently, all went silent, save for the ebbing groans of the sinking shaman and Grigner's heaving breath accompanied by several gusty curses. It's like the wind. These curses are just coming along in the wind. Each gust of wind brings a new curse. The well had run dry. No more lambs remained for the slaughter. What? Where did this come from? Why do we get two random, like, phrases, sayings? This is so weird. It feels like the story is still trying to be serious. Maybe if he'd go completely over the top, landing into some trope, that would do it. Yeah, the trope would do it. A trope, like, a couple of, like, really clear characters embracing, like, 110% their tropes, that would do it. Um, and if we had Grigner the Barbarian, um, if we, we could either do one of two things, we could, um, we can trope, we can, we can make his character lean into a barbarian trope, or we can make it comedic that everybody else thinks that his character leans into, like, he's an absolute barbarian. Everybody around him thinks that he's an absolute barbarian. And then internally, Grigner can be like, why does everybody think I'm a barbarian? Like, I'm, I'm like a normal person. Or like, everything that he does is super, super normal. And we can make like a sort of Monty Python joke about that. Um, Monty Python-esque joke, where, you know, he drinks water from a cup and they're like, oh, he's doing it in such a barbarian way, right? Like things like that, that would be super, super obvious. Um, unfortunately, the author of this one is dead. I don't mean the death of the other way. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, well, it is unfortunate that we wouldn't be able to have a conversation about it with him. The rampaging stead of death, having taken of Grigner for the moment, left the barbarian free to the exploitation of his other perusials. Towering over his head was the misshaped head of the cult's hideous deity, Argon. The fantastic size of the idol, in consideration of its being of pure jade, was enough to cause the senses of any man to stagger and reel. Yet thus was not the case for the behemoth. He had paid only casual notice to this incredible fact, while riveting the whole of his attention upon the jewel protruding from the idol's soul socket. It's masterfully cut faucets. Faucets again. There we've got these faucets. Again, what does he think faucets means? What do I think faucets means? Faucet define. I'm... Yep. It only means that. It only means what we think a faucet means. Like a tap. Like a place where liquid or gas flows from. Nope. He's using it incorrectly. I don't know what's going on with these faucets. It's masterfully cut faucets emitting... Maybe he just means faces. I don't know. Emitting blinding rays of hypnotizing beauty. After all, a man cannot slink from a heavily guarded palace while burdened down by the intense bulk of a squatting statue, providing, of course, that the idol can even be hefted, which, in fact, was beyond the reaches of Grigner's coursing stamina. On the other hand, the jewel, gigantic as it was, would not present a hindrance of any mean concern. Mean concern? Like average? Or do, like, is this... He looked up a synonym for average, I think. Would not present a hindrance of any significant concern. He looked up significant, and then he was like, I don't want to use the word significant. So I'm going to use, like, hmm, what's a synonym for significant? Oh, like average, or like... Even that, nope, that doesn't even make sense. I have no idea. I don't know how this word got selected here. Help me, please. I can make it worth your while, pleaded a soft, anguished strone voice wafting over Grigner's shoulders as he plucked the dull red emerald from its roots. Also, why is this emerald red? I think we've been told twice that this emerald is red. Is there such a thing as a red emerald? Red emerald. Is this, does this exist? Also known as red emerald, red barrel is one of the world's rarest gemstones. Okay, so it's not actually emerald. 
it, but they do exist. Stop saying that it's emerald. <sighs> say it's ruby, say it's emerald. Like, just pick one. Trying to give us some Christmas colors here. We've got emerald, we've got red, red and green everywhere. Turning, Grigner faced the female that had lured him into this bloodbath, but whom had become all but forgotten in the heat of the battle. You! ejaculated the accordion in a pleased tone. I thought that I'd seen the last of you at the tavern, but verily I was mistaken. Grigner advanced into the grips of the female's entrancing stare, severing the golden chains that held her captive upon the altar's highly polished face of ornamental limestone. I was wondering this whole time, what is that altar made of? I am so thankful it was explained. Limestone. Whew. As Grigner lifted the girl from the altar, her arms wound dexterously about his neck, soft and smooth against his harsh exterior. Art thou pleased that we have the, that we have chanced to meet once again? Grigner merely voiced a side grunt, returning the damsel's embrace while he smothered her trim, delicate lips between the coursing protrusions of his reeking maw. I do think it is extremely artful how the author goes so smoothly between, like, usually misogynistic, unfortunately, but largely like, ah, the beautiful, like, um, soft and smooth and blah, 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 against, like, the delicate lips coursing between the coursing protrusions of his reeking maw. Like, it's just so, it's so stark, this, these differences. You is such a strange way to di write dialogue, especially after him using it correctly before. It is. It's super weird. Um, yeah, there does exist a recent full rewrite of this attempt to make it good. I haven't read it, so I don't know if they were campy or serious, but I might at some point compare that might be an interesting study. That would be. If it's serious, that person must have just started from scratch, taking whatever he could figure out reading from the original. Let me know if if, if you do or if you find it or anything. And we, we should we should like, yeah. One of us should talk about it, definitely, because I think that would be very interesting to see where the differences are. Um, and, yeah. Um, I'm curious, yeah, how they would approach rewriting it. As Grigner lifted the... Oh, wait, we... No, we saw that one. Leave us. Take leave of this wretched chamber. Stated Grigner as he placed the female upon her feet. She's now being reduced to an object. Like, let's just be clear. Stated Grigner as he placed the female. She's just an object. She's just like, she's like the jade statue. He just placed the jade statue back onto its feet. As he placed the female upon her feet. She swooned a moment. Of course she swooned, right? She swoons right there. Bam, that's where all the women swoon. He picks her up. He's a barbarian, but he picks her up and he puts her there despite his coarse skin, his scabs, his blah, 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 whatever. He literally, like, two chapters ago, like... KO'd a rat in his chamber, ripped its spine out, severed its head, its body parts strewn about, and now, of course, he just makes women swoon by picking them up. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Grigner the Accordion, a retelling of the Eye of Argon. <laughs> oh, goodness. Grigner, it didn't happen. Grig <laughs> Published 2019. Interesting. Wow. She swooned a moment, causing Grigner to give her support, then regained her stance. Art thou able to find your way through the accursed passages of this castle? Mrifk! Every one of the corridors of this damned place are identical. Is Mrifk? I thought Mrifk was a dude, but I guess maybe it's like some kind of curse. Aye, I was at one time a slave of Prince Agafim. His clammy touch sent a sour swill through my belly, but my efforts reaped a harvest. I gained the pig's liking, whereby he allowed me the freedom of the palace. It was through this means that I eventually managed escape at the western gate. His trust found him. With a dagger thrust his ribs. The wench stated, Whimsic... We are in for a treat. What a word this is. Whimsicorically. Whimsic... Whimsicorically. Yeah, whimsicorically. Not just whimsically. Whimsically wasn't enough. Whimsicorically. What were you doing at the tavern whence I discovered you? 
asked Grigner. Maybe this was intended to be campy. I don't know how you write a word like whimsicorically seriously. I don't know how you take yourself seriously after writing this. There is no way, like, that requires some minimal command of the English language to come up with a, with a word that weird. How dare the author rename Krigner? <laughs> that with the Y, yeah, that's... What were you doing at the tavern once I discovered you? Of course, Grigner, the barbarian, once again using whence. As he lifted the female through the opening into the mausoleum. Do we, we don't know her name, do we? We still don't know her name. She was clearly important. She was at one point, a, oh, she was at one point a slave. My bad, maybe she wasn't important. Maybe she has no name because she was a slave. I still, I feel like even the slave would be better for them to repeat than the female. Neither of them are very good. They should just name this character, definitely. Um. I had sought to lay low from the palace's guards as they conducted their search for me. The tavern was seldom frequented by the palace guards, and my identity was unknown to the common soldiers. It was through the disturbance that you caused that the palace guards were attracted to the tavern. I was dragged away shortly after you were escorted to the palace. What are you called by, female? Carthena. So she does have a name. She had a name this whole time. And despite the fact that we were clearly narrating this in third person, we couldn't tell the audience her name in the previous scene when she was basically about to be, like, raped by a bunch of priests. No, because it would have removed the mystery. The mystery was about what her name is. Carthena, daughter of Mincardos, Duke of Barwego, whose lands border along the northwestern fringes of Gorzom. I was paid as homage to Agafim upon his 38th year. Husked the femme. Husked the femme. Husked the femme. That was written. That's a sentence. And I'm called a barbarian, grunted Grigner in a disgusted tone. Aye, the ways of our civilization are in many ways warped and distorted. But what is your calling? She queried, bustily. Sorry, she queried, bustily? What are you, what are you, how do you ask something bust?